Embark on a captivating journey through the rich tapestry of Indian history with untold chronicles. From the ancient civilizations that flourished in the Indus Valley to the vibrant cultures of the Ganges and the dramatic landscapes of the Deccan Plateau, this series unfolds the narrative of one of the world's oldest and most influential civilizations. Discover the diverse regions of northern India, each with its distinctive cultural history, from the arid Baluchistan uplands to the fertile plains of the Indus Valley. Traverse the Ganges River Valley, a heartland of high-density population and agricultural abundance. Explore the enchanting Himalayan foothills, where history echoes through the hilly landscapes and the stories etched in the Bandar, Reva, and Khmer plateaus. As we journey south, witness the gradual eastward declivity along the Deccan Plateau, unveiling the Mahanadi, Godavari, Krishna, and Kaveri rivers. Learn about the impact of the Western Ghats on the region's climate and the cultural significance of the southwest monsoon that shapes life on the narrow western littoral. The Indian subcontinent, the great landmass of South Asia, is the home of one of the world's oldest and most influential civilizations. In this article, the subcontinent, which for historical purposes is usually called simply, India, is understood to comprise the areas of not only the present-day Republic of India, free from British rule since August 15, 1947, celebrated as the country's Independence Day, but also the Republics of Pakistan, partitioned from India in 1947, and Bangladesh, which formed the eastern part of Pakistan until its independence in 1971. For the histories of these latter two countries since their creation, see Pakistan and Bangladesh. Since early times the Indian subcontinent appears to have provided an attractive habitat for human occupation. Toward the south it is effectively sheltered by wide expanses of ocean, which tended to isolate it culturally in ancient times, while to the north it is protected by the massive ranges of the Himalayas, which also sheltered it from the Arctic winds and the air currents of Central Asia. Only in the northwest and northeast is there easier access by land. And it was through those two sectors that most of the early contacts with the outside world took place. Within the framework of hills and mountains represented by the Indo-Iranian borderlands on the west, the Indo-Myanmar borderlands in the east, and the Himalayas to the north, the subcontinent may in broadest terms be divided into two major divisions. In the north, the basins of the Indus and Ganges, Ganga, rivers, the Indogangetic plain, and, to the south, the block of Archean rocks that forms the Deccan Plateau region. The expansive alluvial plain of the river basins provided the environment and focus for the rise of two great phases of city life, the civilization of the Indus Valley, known as the Indus Civilization, during the 3rd millennium BCE, and, during the 1st millennium BCE, that of the Ganges. To the south of this zone, and separating it from the peninsula proper, is a belt of hills and forests, running generally from west to east and to this day largely inhabited by tribal people. This belt has played mainly a negative role throughout Indian history in that it remained relatively thinly populated and did not form the focal point of any of the principal regional cultural developments of South Asia. However, it is traversed by various routes linking the more attractive areas north and south of it. The Nirmatha Narbada, river flows through this belt toward the west, mostly along the Vindhya range, which has long been regarded as the symbolic boundary between northern and southern India. The northern parts of India represent a series of contrasting regions, each with its own distinctive cultural history and its own distinctive population. In the northwest the valleys of the Baluchistan uplands, now largely in Balochistan, Pakistan, are a low rainfall area, producing mainly wheat and barley and having a low density of population. Its residents, mainly tribal people, are in many respects closely akin to their Iranian neighbors. The adjacent Indus plains are also an area of extremely low rainfall, but the annual flooding of the river in ancient times and the exploitation of its waters by canal irrigation in the modern period have enhanced agricultural productivity, and the population is correspondingly denser than that of Baluchistan. The Indus Valley may be divided into three parts. In the north are the plains of the five tributary rivers of the Punjab, Persian, Panjab, five waters, in the center the consolidated waters of the Indus and its tributaries flow through the alluvial plains of Sindh, 
and in the south the waters pass naturally into the Indus Delta. East of the latter is the Great Indian, or Thar, Desert, which is in turn bounded on the east by a hill system known as the Arvali Range, the northernmost extent of the Deccan Plateau region. Beyond them is the hilly region of Rajasthan and the Malva Plateau. To the south is the Kadiawar Peninsula, forming both geographically and culturally an extension of Rajasthan. All of these regions have a relatively denser population than the preceding group, but for topographical reasons they have tended to be somewhat isolated, at least during historical times. East of the Punjab and Rajasthan, northern India develops into a series of belts running broadly west to east and following the line of the foothills of the Himalayan ranges in the north. The southern belt consists of a hilly, forested area broken by the numerous escarpments in close association with the Vindhya range, including the Bandar, Reva, and Khymer plateaus. Between the hills of central India and the Himalayas lies the Ganges River Valley proper, constituting an area of high-density population, moderate rainfall, and high agricultural productivity. Archaeology suggests that, from the beginning of the first millennium BCE, rice cultivation has played a large part in supporting this population. The Ganges Valley divides into three major parts, to the west is the Ganges Yamuna Dobe, the land area that is formed by the confluence of the two rivers, east of the confluence lies the middle Ganges Valley, in which population tends to increase and cultivation of rice predominates, and to the southeast lies the extensive delta of the combined Ganges and Brahmaputra rivers. The Brahmaputra flows from the northeast, rising from the Tibetan Himalayas and emerging from the mountains into the Assam Valley, being bounded on the east by the Pat Kai Bum Range and the Naga Hills and on the south by the Mikur, Kasi, Jainsha, and Garo Hills. There is plenty of evidence that influences reached India from the northeast in ancient times, even if they are less prominent than those that arrived from the northwest. Along the Deccan Plateau there is a gradual eastward declivity, which dispenses its major river systems, the Mahanadi, Godavari, Krishna, and Kaveri, Kaveri, into India the Bay from of the Bengal, Paleolithic period rising some the 3,000 feet, Indus civilization. 1,000 meters, or the more along the western of edge of the Deccan, are known the escarpment only through known as the Western Ghats traps the moisture of winds from the Arabian Since Sea, the late 20th most century, notably during much the south new data has emerged, allowing a tropical or reconstruction than was along formerly the narrow possible. Western literal and depriving this the section will discuss five major periods. One, the absence the early of prehistoric in the South Indian before the 8th millennium the region BCE. Dependent Two, entirely the period on of the prehistoric agriculturalists and past the arrival of the southwest monsoon to the mid fourth millennium BCE. Pivotal BCE. Annual event Three, in the early culture. Indus or early Harappan period, so named for the excavated city of Harappa in eastern Pakistan, witnessing the emergence of the first cities in the Indus River system, circa 3500 to 2600 BCE. Four, the Indus or Harappan civilization, circa 2600 to 2000 BCE, or perhaps ending as late as 1750 BCE, and, 5, the post-urban period, which follows the Indus civilization and precedes the rise of cities in northern India during the second quarter of the first millennium BCE, c. 1750 to 750 BCE. The materials available for a reconstruction of the history of India prior to the 3rd century BCE are almost entirely the products of archaeological research. Traditional and textual sources, transmitted orally for many centuries, are available from the closing centuries of the 2nd millennium BCE, but their use depends largely on the extent to which any passage can be dated or associated with archaeological evidence. For the rise of civilization in the Indus Valley and for contemporary events in other parts of the subcontinent, the evidence of archaeology is still the principal source of information. Even when it becomes possible to read the short inscriptions of the Harappan seals, it is unlikely that they will provide much information to supplement other sources. In those circumstances it is necessary to approach the early history of India largely through the eyes of the archaeologists, and it will be wise to retain a balance between an objective assessment of archaeological data and its synthetic interpretation. The Early Prehistoric Period In the mid-19th century, archaeologists in southern India identified hand axes comparable to those of Stone Age Europe. For nearly a century thereafter, evaluation of a burgeoning body of evidence consisted in the attempt to correlate Indian chronologies with the well-documented European and Mediterranean chronologies. 
As the vast majority of early finds were from surface sites, they long remained without precise dates or cultural contexts. More recently, however, the excavation of numerous cave and dune sites has yielded artifacts in association with organic material that can be dated using the carbon-14 method, and the techniques of thermoluminescent and paleomagnetic analysis now permit dating of pottery fragments and other inorganic materials. Research beginning in the late 20th century has focused on the unique environment of the subcontinent as the context for a cultural evolution analogous to, but not uniform with, that of other regions. Increasing understanding of plate tectonics, to site one development, has greatly advanced this endeavor. Most outlines of Indian prehistory have employed nomenclature once thought to reflect a worldwide sequence of human cultural evolution. The European concept of the Old Stone Age, or Paleolithic period, comprising lower, middle, and upper stages, remains useful with regard to South Asia in identifying levels of technology, apart from any universal timeline. Similarly, what has been called the Indian Mesolithic period, Middle Stone Age, corresponds in general typological terms to that of Europe. For the subsequent periods, the designations Neolithic period, New Stone Age, and Chalcolithic Age, Copper Stone Age, also are applied, but increasingly, as archaeology has yielded more detailed cultural profiles for those periods, scholars have come to emphasize the subsistence bases of early societies, e.g., hunting and gathering, pastoralism, and agriculture. The terms early Harapan and Harapan, from the site where remains of a major city of the Indus civilization were discovered in 1921, are used primarily in a chronological way but also loosely in a cultural sense, relating respectively to periods or cultures that preceded the appearance of city life in the Indus Valley and to the Indus civilization itself. The Indian Paleolithic the oldest artifacts yet found on the subcontinent, marking what may be called the beginning of the Indian Lower Paleolithic, come from the western end of the Shiwalik Range, near Rawalpindi in northern Pakistan. These quartzite pebble tools and flakes date to about 2 million years ago, according to paleomagnetic analysis, and represent a pre-hand axe industry of a type that appears to have persisted for an extensive period thereafter. The artifacts are associated with extremely rich sedimentary evidence and fossil fauna, but thus far no correlative hominin, i.e., members of the human lineage, remains have been found. In the same region the earliest hand axes, of the type commonly associated with Acheulean industry, have been dated paleomagnetically to about 500,000 years ago. The Great Indian Desert straddling what is now the southern half of the India-Pakistan border, supplied significant archaeological materials in the late 20th century. Hand axes found at Divana, Rajasthan, similar to those from the Shiwalik range, yield slightly younger dates of about 400,000 years ago. Examination of the desert soil strata and other evidence has revealed a correlation between prevailing climates and the successive levels of technology that constitute the Paleolithic. For example, a prolonged humid phase, as attested by reddish-brown soil with a deep profile, appears to have commenced some 140,000 years ago and lasted until about 25,000 years ago, roughly the extent of the Middle Paleolithic period. During that time the area of the present desert provided a rich environment for hunting. The Rory Hills, located at the Indus River margins of the desert, contain a group of sites associated with sources of chert, a type of stone that is a principal raw material for making tools and weapons. Evidence surrounding these chert bands, in an alluvial plain otherwise largely devoid of stone, suggests their development as a major factory center during the Middle Paleolithic. The transition in this same region to a drier climate during the period from about 40,000 to about 25,000 years ago coincides with the onset of the Upper Paleolithic, which lasted until about 15,000 years ago. The basic innovation marking this stage is the production of parallel-sided blades from a prepared core. Also, tools of the Upper Paleolithic exhibit adaptations for working particular materials, such as leather, wood, and bone. The earliest rock paintings yet discovered in the region date to the Upper Paleolithic. Other important Paleolithic sites that have been excavated include those at Hunsky in Karnataka State, at Sangau Cave in Northwest Frontier Province, Pakistan, and in the Vindhya Range separating the Ganges Basin from the Deccan Plateau. 
At the latter, local workers readily identified a weathered upper Paleolithic limestone carving as a representation of a mother goddess. Mesolithic Hunters The progressive diminution in the size of stone artifacts that began in the Middle Paleolithic reached its climax in the small parallel-sided blades and microliths of what has been called the Indian Mesolithic. A great proliferation of Mesolithic cultures is evident throughout India, although they are known almost exclusively from surface collections of tools. Cultures of this period exhibited a wide variety of subsistence patterns, including hunting and gathering, fishing, and, at least for part of the period, some herding and small-scale agriculture. It may be inferred from numerous examples that hunting cultures frequently coexisted and interacted with agricultural and pastoral communities. These relationships must have continually varied from region to region as a result of environmental and other factors. Strikingly, such patterns of interaction persisted in the subcontinent throughout the remainder of the prehistoric period and long into the historic, with vestiges still discernible in some areas in the 20th century. Thus, chronologically, the Mesolithic cultures cover an enormous span. In Sri Lanka several Mesolithic sites have been dated to as early as about 30,000 years ago, the oldest yet recorded for the period in South Asia. At the other end of the subcontinent, in caves of the Hindu Kush in northern Afghanistan, evidence of occupation dating to between 15,000 and 10,000 BCE represents the Epipaleolithic stage, which may be considered to fall within the Mesolithic. The domestication of sheep and goats is thought to have begun in this region and period. Many of the caves and rock shelters of central India contain rock paintings depicting a variety of subjects, including game animals and such human activities as hunting, honey collecting, and dancing. This art appears to have developed from Upper Paleolithic precursors and reveals much about life in the period. Along with the art have come increasingly clear indications that some of the caves were sites of religious activity. The earliest agriculturalists and pastoralists. Neolithic agriculture in the Indus Valley and Baluchistan. The Indo-Iranian borderlands form the eastern extension of the Iranian plateau and in some ways mirror the environment of the Fertile Crescent, the arc of agricultural lands extending from the Tigris-Euphrates River system to the Nile Valley, in the Middle East. Across the plateau, lines of communication existed from early antiquity, which would suggest a broad parallelism of developments at both the eastern and western extremities. During the late 20th century, knowledge of early settlements on the borders of the Indus system and Baluchistan was revolutionized by excavations at Mergar and elsewhere. The group of sites at Mergar provides evidence of some five or six thousand years of occupation comprising two major periods, the first from the 8th through the 6th millennium BCE and the second from the 5th through the 4th, and possibly the 3rd, millennium. The earliest evidence occurs in a mound 23 feet, 7 meters, deep discovered beneath massive alluvial deposits. Two sub-phases of period I are apparent from the mound artifacts. Phase IA dating to the 8th to 7th millennium BCE, was an aceramic, i.e., lacking pottery, Neolithic occupation. The main tools were stone blades, including lunatez and triangles, some probably mounted in wooden hafts with bitumen mastic, a relatively small number of ground stone axes have been found. Domestication of wheat and barley apparently reached the area sometime during this phase, as did that of sheep and goats, although the preponderance of gazelle bones among the animal remains suggests continued dependence on hunting. Houses of mud brick date from the beginning of this phase and continue throughout the occupation. Accompaniments to the simple burial of human remains included shell or stone bead necklaces, baskets, and occasionally young caprids, both sheep and goats, slaughtered for the purpose. Phase 1b, dating to the 7th to 6th millennium, is characterized by the emergence of pottery and improvements in agriculture. By the beginning of Phase 1b, cattle, apparently Bos Indicus, the Indian humped variety, had come to predominate over game animals, as well as over sheep and goats. A new type of building, the small regular compartments of which identify it almost certainly as a granary, first appeared during this phase and became prevalent in Period 2, indicating the frequent occurrence of crop surpluses. Burial took a more elaborate form, a funerary chamber was dug at one end of a pit, 
and, after inhumation, the chamber was sealed by a mud brick wall. From the latter phase of period I also come the first small, hand-modeled female figurines of unburned clay. The period I evidence at Mergar provides a clear picture of an early agricultural settlement exhibiting domestic architecture and a variety of well-established crafts. The use of seashells and of various semi-precious stones, including turquoise and lapis lazuli, indicates the existence of trade networks extending from the coast and perhaps also from Central Asia. Striking changes characterize period 2. It appears that some major tectonic event took place at the beginning of the period, circa 5500 BCE, causing the deposition of great quantities of silt on the plain, almost completely burying the original mound at Mergar. Nearly all features of the earlier culture persisted, though in altered form. There was an increase in the use of pottery. The granary structures proliferated, sometimes on a larger scale. The remains of several massive brick walls and platforms suggest something approaching monumental architecture. Evidence appears of several new crafts, including the first examples of the use of copper and ivory. The area of the settlement appears to have grown to accommodate an increasing population. While the settlement at Mergar merits extensive consideration, it should not be perceived as a unique site. There are indications, not yet fully explored, that other equally early sites may exist in other parts of Baluchistan and elsewhere on the Indo-Iranian borderlands. In the northern parts of the Indus system, the earliest known settlements are substantially later than Mergar. For example, at Sarai Kola, near the ruins of Taxila in the Pakistan Punjab, the earliest occupation dates from the end of the 4th millennium and clearly represents a tradition quite distinct from that of contemporary Sindh or Balochistan with ground stone axes and plain burnished red-brown pottery. The same is the case at Burzaham in the Vale of Kashmir, where deep pit dwellings are associated with ground stone axes, bone tools, and grey burnished pottery. Evidence of the Aceramic Neolithic stage is reported at Gufkral, another site in the Kashmir region, which has been dated by radiocarbon to the third millennium and later. Developments in the Ganges Basin in the hills to the south of the Ganges, Ganga, Valley, a group of sites has been assigned to the Vindhya Neolithic, for at least one of these, Koldua, dates as early as the 7th millennium have been reported. The sites contain circular huts made of timber posts and thatch, associated implements and vessels include stone blades, ground stone axes, bone tools, and crude handmade pottery, often bearing the marks of cords or baskets used in shaping the clay. In one case a small cattle pen has been excavated. Rice husks occur, though whether from wild or cultivated varieties remains to be determined. There exists considerable uncertainty about the chronology of these settlements, very few radiocarbon dates penetrate further than the 2nd millennium, earliest settlements in eastern India. Archaeologists have long postulated the existence of Neolithic settlements in the eastern border regions of South Asia on the basis of widespread collections of ground stone axes and adzes, often of distinctive forms, comparable to those of Southeast Asia and South China. There is, however, little substantial evidence for the date of these collections or for the culture of the people who made them. Excavations at one site, Saritaru, near the city of Guwahati revealed stone axes and shouldered celts, one of the distinctive tool types of the Neolithic, in association with cord or basket-marked pottery. The Rise of Urbanism in the Indus Valley Principal Sites of the Indus Civilization Principal Sites of the Indus Civilization From about 5000 BCE, increasing numbers of settlements began to appear throughout the Indo-Iranian borderlands. These, as far as can be judged, were village communities of settled agriculturalists, employing common means of subsistence in the cultivation of wheat, barley, and other crops and in the keeping of cattle, sheep, and goats, there was a broadly common level of technology based on the use of stone for some artifacts and copper and bronze for others. Comparison and contrast of the high-quality painted pottery of the period suggest distinct groupings among the communities. At a somewhat later date, Probably toward the middle of the 4th millennium BCE, agricultural settlements began to spread more widely in the Indus Valley itself, 
The earliest of these provide clear links with the cultures along or beyond the western margins of the Indus Valley. In the course of time, a remarkable change took place in the form of the Indus settlements, suggesting that some kind of closer interaction was developing, often over considerable distances, and that a process of convergence was underway. This continued for approximately 500 years and can now be identified as marking a transition toward the full urban society that emerged at Harappa and similar sites about 2600 BCE. For this reason, this stage has been named the Early Harappan, or Early Indus, culture. Extent and Chronology of Early Harappan Culture Harappa Ruins Harappa Ruins Ruins of the ancient settlement of Harappa in Punjab, Pakistan. It is now clear that sites assignable to the early Harappan period extend over an immense area, from the Indus Delta in the south, southeastward into Saurashtra, up the Indus Valley to western Punjab in the northwest, eastward past Harappa to the Bawalwalpur region of Pakistan, and, in the northeast, into the Indian states of Punjab and Haryana. In short, the area of the early Harappan culture was nearly coextensive with that of the mature Indus civilization. Radiocarbon dating of artifacts from a number of the excavated sites provides a fairly consistent chronological picture. The early Harappan period began in the mid-4th millennium BCE and continued until the mid-3rd millennium, when the mature Indus civilization displaced it in many regions. In some regions, notably in Punjab, the mature urban style seems never to have been fully established, and in these areas the early Harappan style continued with little or no outward sign of mature Harappan contact until about 2000 BCE. Principal Sites One of the most significant features of the early Harappan settlements is the evidence for a hierarchy among the sites, culminating in a number of substantial walled towns. The first site to be recognized as belonging to the early Harappan period was Omri in 1929. In 1948 the British archaeologist Sir Mortimer Wheeler discovered a small deposit of pottery stratified below the remains of the mature Indus city at Harappa. The next site to be excavated with a view to uncovering the early Harappan period was Khat Diji, in present-day Sindh province, Pakistan. A stone rubble wall surrounded this settlement which appears to date to about 3000 BCE. An even earlier example is Raymond Derry, near Dera Ismail Khan, which appears to have achieved its walled status during the last centuries of the 4th millennium. There the roughly rectangular, grid-patterned settlement was surrounded by a massive wall of mud brick. Early Harappan Kalibangan, Kali Bunga, in Rajasthan resembled Raymond Derry in form. It later served as the basis for an expanded settlement of the mature Indus civilization. Still farther east in the eastern Punjab and in Haryana are many other early Harappan sites. Among them several have been excavated, notably Banawali in Maithil. Another example of a walled settlement of the period is Thero in southern Sindh. This was probably originally a coastal site, although it is now many miles from the sea. There the surrounding wall and the extant traces of houses are of local stone. Subsistence and technology. Many of the excavated sites mentioned above have yet to be fully studied and the findings published, and knowledge of the various features of the life and economy of their inhabitants remains somewhat scanty. All the evidence indicates that the subsistence base of early Harappan economy remained much as it had already developed at Murgar some two millennia earlier, cattle, sheep, and goats constituted the principal domestic animals, and wheat and barley formed the staple crops. From Kalibangan and several other sites in Bawalwalpur and Punjab comes intriguing evidence concerning the use of the plow. At the former site, excavators discovered what appeared to be a plowed field surface preserved beneath buildings from the mature Indus period. The pattern of crisscrossed furrows was virtually identical to that still employed in the region, the wider furrows in one direction being used for taller crops, such as peas, and the narrow perpendicular rows being used for oilseed plants such as those of the genus Sesamum, Sesame. From Banawali and sites in the desiccated Sarasvati River Valley came terracotta models of plows, supporting the earlier interpretation of the field pattern. Culture and Religion 
it may be concluded on the basis of pottery decoration that major changes were taking place in the intellectual life of the whole region during the early Harapan period. At a number of sites the pottery bears a variety of incised or painted marks, some superficially resembling script. The significance of these marks is not clear, but most probably they represent owner's marks, applied at the time of manufacture. Although it would be an exaggeration to regard these marks as actual writing, they suggest that the need for a script was beginning to arise. Among the painted decorations found on the pottery, some appear to carry a distinctly religious symbolism. The clearest instance of this is in the widespread occurrence of the buffalo head motif, characterized by elongated horns and in some cases sprouting people, ficus religiosa, branches or other plant forms. These have been interpreted as representing a buffalo deity. A painted bowl from Lawan displays a pair of such heads, one a buffalo and the other a boss indicus, each adorned with people foliage. Other devices from the painted pottery may also have religious significance, particularly the people leaves that occur as independent motifs. Other examples include fish forms and the fish scale pattern that later appears as a common decoration on the mature Indus pottery. Throughout the region, evidence supports a convergence of form and decoration in anticipation of the more conservative Indus style. The remains discussed above, considered collectively, suggest that four or five millennia of uninterrupted agricultural life in the Indus region set the stage for the final emergence of an indigenous Indus civilization about 2600 BCE. It could also be argued, however, that the substantial early Harapan walled towns constituted cities. Much research, excavation, and comparative analysis are required before this fertile and provocative period can be understood. The Indus Civilization character and significance. Explore the language, architecture, and culture of the Indus civilization, in the Indus River Basin. Explore the language, architecture, and culture of the Indus civilization, in the Indus River Basin. An overview of the Indus civilization see all videos for this article. While the Indus, or Harapan, civilization may be considered the culmination of a long process indigenous to the Indus Valley, a number of parallels exist between developments on the Indus River and the rise of civilization in Mesopotamia. It is striking to compare the Indus with this better known and more fully documented region and to see how closely the two coincide with respect to the emergence of cities and of such major concomitants of civilization as writing, standardized weights and measures, and monumental architecture. Yet nearly all the earlier writers have sensed the Indianness of the civilization, even when they were largely unable to articulate it. Thus, historian V. Gordon Child wrote that, India confronts Egypt and Babylonia by the third millennium with a thoroughly individual and independent civilization of her own, technically the peer of the rest. And plainly it is deeply rooted in Indian soil. The Indus civilization represents a very perfect adjustment of human life to a specific environment. And it has endured, it is already specifically Indian and forms the basis of modern Indian culture. New Light on the Most Ancient East, 4th edition, 1952. The force of child's words can be appreciated even without an examination of the Indus Valley script found on seals, the attention paid to domestic bathrooms, the drains, and the great bath at Mohenjo-daro can all be compared to elements in the later Indian civilization. The bullock carts with a framed canopy, called ikas, and boats are little changed to this day. The absence of pins and the love of bangles and of elaborate nose ornaments are all peculiarly South Asian. The religion of the Indus also is replete with suggestions of traits known from later India. The significance of the bull, the tiger, and the elephant, the composite animals, the seated yogi god of the seals, the tree spirits and the objects resembling the Shiva Linga, a phallus symbolic of the god Shiva, of later times, all these are suggestive of enduring forms in later Indian civilization. It is still impossible to do more than guess at the social organization or the political and administrative control implied by this vast area of cultural uniformity. The evidence of widespread trade in many commodities, the apparent uniformity of weights and measures, the common script, and the uniformity, almost common currency, 
of the seals all indicate some measure of political and economic control and point to the great cities Mohenjo-daro and Harappa as their centers. The presence of the great granaries on the citadel mounds in these cities and of the citadels themselves suggests, partly on the analogies of the cities of Mesopotamia, the existence of priest kings, or at least a priestly oligarchy, that controlled the economy and civil government. The intellectual mechanism of this government and the striking degree of control implicit in it are still matters of speculation. Nor can scholars yet speak with any certainty regarding relations between the cities and surrounding villages. Much more research needs to be done, on many such topics, before the full character of the Indus civilization can be revealed. Chronology the first serious attempt at establishing a chronology for the Indus civilization relied on cross-dating with Mesopotamia. In this way, Cyril John Gad cited the period of Sargon of Akkad (2334–2279 BCE) and the subsequent Isin-Larsa period (2017–1794 BCE) as the time when trade between ancient India and Mesopotamia was at its height. Calibration of the ever-growing number of radiocarbon dates provides a reasonably consistent series from site to site. The broad picture thus obtained suggests that the mature Indus civilization emerged between 2600 and 2500 BCE and continued in full glory to about 2000 BCE. Thereafter the evidence is still somewhat unclear, but the late stage of the mature culture probably continued until about 1700 BCE by which time it is probably accurate to speak of the post-urban, or post-Harapan, stage. All the earlier writers have stressed the remarkable uniformity of the products of the Harapan civilization, and for this reason they provide a definite hallmark for its settlements. The more recent evidence suggests that, if the outermost sites are joined by lines, the area enclosed will be a little less than about 500,000 square miles, 1,300,000 square kilometers, considerably larger than present-day Pakistan, and if, as is generally inferred, this cultural uniformity coincided with some sort of political and administrative unity, the size of the resulting empire is truly vast. Within this area, several hundred sites have been identified, the great majority of which are on the plains of the Indus or its tributaries or on the now dry course of the ancient Sarasvati River, which flowed south of the Sutlej River and then, perhaps, southward to the Indian Ocean, east of the main course of the Indus itself. Outside the Indus system a few sites occur on the Makran coast, the westernmost of which is at Sutkajan Dor, near the present-day frontier with Iran. These sites were probably ports or trading posts, supporting the sea trade with the Persian Gulf, and were established in what otherwise remained a largely separate cultural region. The uplands of Baluchistan, while showing clear evidence of trade and contact with the Indus civilization, appear to have remained outside the direct Harapan rule. To the east of the Indus Delta, other coastal sites are found beyond the marshy salt flats of the Ran of Koch, Kutch, and in the interior of the Katiawar Peninsula, Saurashtra. These include the estuarine trading post at Lothal on the Gulf of Kumbat, Kambay, as well as many other sites, some of which are major. West of the Indus River a number of important sites are situated on the alluvial Kochchi Desert region of Balochistan, Pakistan, toward Sibi and Quetta. East of the Indus system, toward the north, a number of sites occur right up to the edge of the Himalayan foothills, where at Alamgurpur, north of Delhi, the easternmost Harapan, or perhaps, more properly, late Harapan, settlement has been discovered and partly excavated. If the area covered by these sites is compared with that of the early Harapan settlements, it will be seen that there is an expansion in several directions, along the coast to both the west and the east and eastward through the Punjab toward the Ganges Yamuna Dobe. Planning and Architecture Mohenjo-daro the Harapan sites range from extensive cities to small villages or outposts. The two largest are Mohenjo-daro and Harappa, each perhaps originally about a mile square in overall dimensions. Each shares a characteristic layout, oriented roughly north-south with a great fortified citadel mound to the west and a larger, lower city to the east. A similar layout is also discernible in the somewhat smaller town of Kalibangan, and several other major settlements appear to have shared this scheme. 
Other major sites include Dalavira and Sirkatada near the Ran of Koch, Nasharo Firaz in Balochistan, Pakistan, Shortagai in northern Afghanistan, Amri, Chanhudaro, and Jaderjodaro in Sindh, and Sandanawala in Bawalwalpur. Among the smaller sites, special interest attaches to Lothal, where a number of unique and problematic features were discovered in excavations. Of all the sites, Harappa, Mohenjo-daro, Kalibangan, and Lothal have been most extensively excavated, and more can be said of their original layout and planning. Thus, they are considered in greater detail below. At three of the excavated major sites, the Citadel Mound is on a north-south axis and about twice as long as it is broad. The lower city is laid out in a grid pattern of streets. At Kalibangan these were of regularly controlled widths, with the major streets running through, while the minor lanes were sometimes offset, creating different sizes of blocks. At all three sites the citadel was protected by a massive defensive wall of brick, which at Kalibangan was strengthened at intervals by square or rectangular bastions. At Kalibangan, traces of a somewhat less substantial wall around the lower town have also been discovered. In all three cases the city was situated near a river, although these courses are now extinct. The most common building material at every site was brick, but the proportions of burned brick to unburned mud brick vary. Mohenjo-daro employs burned brick, perhaps because timber was more readily available, while mud brick was reserved for fillings and mass work. Kalibangan, on the other hand, reserved burned brick for bathrooms, wells, and drains. Most of the domestic architecture at Kalibangan was in mud brick. Brick was generally bonded in courses of alternate headers and stretchers, the so-called English bond. Stone was rarely, if ever, employed structurally. Timber was occasionally used as a lacing for brickwork, particularly in large-scale work such as the defenses or the granary at Mohenjo-daro. The common bricks were made in an open mold, but for special purposes sawed bricks were also employed. Timber was used for the universal flat roofs, and in some instances the sockets indicate square-cut beams with spans of as much as 14 feet 4 .5 meters. The houses were invariably entered from the side lanes, with the walls to the main streets presenting a blank brick facade broken only by the drainage chutes. Apart from domestic structures, a wide range of shops and craft workshops have been encountered, including potter's kills, dyer's vats, and the shops of metalworkers, shell workers, and bead makers. There is surprisingly little evidence of public places of worship, although at Mohenjo-daro a number of possible temples were unearthed in the lower city, and other buildings of a ritual character were reported in the citadel. The size of houses varies considerably. At the one extreme are single-roomed barracks, with cooking and bathing areas formed within by partition walls, and at the other are large houses around a central courtyard or sometimes with a set of intersecting courtyards, each with its own adjoining rooms. Nearly all the larger houses had private wells. In many cases brick stairways led to what must have been upper stories or flat roofs. The bathrooms were usually indicated by the fine quality of the brickwork in the floor and by waste drains. The mounds of Mohenjo-daro lie near the right bank of the Indus in the Larkana district of Sindh province. The excavations revealed that the lowest level of former occupation was covered by deposits of alluvial silt to a depth of about 30 feet 10 meters, attributable to annual flooding. The lowest levels are thus below the present-day water table and are still largely unexcavated. As noted above, the main features of the layout of Mohenjo-daro are a citadel to the west and a lower city and grid of streets to the east. Enough has been said of the general features of the lower city to make it unnecessary to say more of the considerable areas excavated in that part. The citadel, however, demands further attention. In the citadel the English archaeologists Sir, social and political system. Despite a growing body of archaeological evidence, the social and political structures of the Indus state remain objects of conjecture. The apparent craft specialization and localized craft groupings at Mohenjo-daro, along with the great divergence in house types and size, point towards some degree of social stratification. Trade was extensive and apparently well-regulated, 
providing imported raw materials for use at internal production centers, distributing finished goods throughout the region, and arguably culminating in the establishment of Harapan colonies in both Mesopotamia and Badakhshan. The remarkable uniformity of weights and measures throughout the Indus lands, as well as the development of such presumably civic works as the Great Granaries, implies a strong degree of political and administrative control over a wide area. Further, the widespread occurrence of inscriptions in the Harapan script almost certainly indicates the use of a single lingua franca. Nevertheless, in the absence of inscriptions that can be read and interpreted, it is inevitable that far less is known of these aspects of the Indus civilization than those of contemporaneous Mesopotamia. The excavations of the Indus cities have produced much evidence of artistic activity. Such finds are important, because they provide an insight into the minds, lives, and religious beliefs of their creators. Stone sculpture is extremely rare, and much of it is quite crude. The total repertoire cannot compare to the work done in Mesopotamia during the same periods. The figures are apparently all intended as images for worship. Such figures include seated men, recumbent composite animals, or, in unique instances, from Harappa, a standing nude male and a dancing figure. The finest pieces are of excellent quality. There is also a small but notable repertoire of cast bronze figures, including several fragments and complete examples of dancing girls, small chariots, carts, and animals. The technical excellence of the bronzes suggests a highly developed art, but the number of examples is still small. They appear to be Indian workmanship rather than imports. The popular art of the Harapans was in the form of terracotta figurines. The majority are of standing females, often heavily laden with jewelry, but standing males, some with beard and horns, are also present. It has been generally agreed that these figures are largely deities, perhaps a great mother and a great god, but some small figures of mothers with children or of domestic activities are probably toys. There are varieties of terracotta animals, carts, and toys, such as monkeys pierced to climb a string and cattle that nod their heads. Painted pottery is the only evidence that there was a tradition of painting. Much of the work is executed with boldness and delicacy of feeling, but the restrictions of the art do not leave much scope for creativity. The steatite seals, to whose manufacture reference was made above, form the most extensive series of objects of art in the civilization. The great majority show a humpless unicorn or bull in profile, while others show the Indian humped bull, elephant, bison, rhinoceros, or tiger. The animal frequently stands before a ritual object, variously identified as a standard, a manger, or even an incense burner. A considerable number of the seals contain scenes of obvious mythological or religious significance. The interpretation of these seals is, however, often highly problematic. The seals were certainly more widely diffused than other artistic artifacts and show a much higher level of workmanship. Probably they functioned as amulets, as well as more practical devices to identify merchandise. Religion and Burial Customs in spite of the unread inscriptions, there is a considerable body of evidence that allows for conjecture concerning the religious beliefs of the Harapans. First, there are the buildings identified as temples or as possessing a ritual function, such as the Great Bath at Mohenjo-daro. Then there are the stone sculptures found to a large extent associated with these buildings. Finally, there are the terracotta figures, as well as the seals and amulets that depict scenes with evident mythological or religious content. The interpretation of such data necessarily involves a largely subjective element, but most commentators have thought that they indicate a religious system that was already distinctly Indian. It is assumed that there was a great god, who had many of the attributes later associated with the Hindu god Shiva, and a great mother, who was the great god's spouse and shared the attributes of Shiva's wife Durgaparvati. Evidence also exists of some sort of animal cult, related particularly to the bull, the buffalo, and the tiger. Mythological animals include a composite bull elephant. Some seals suggest influence from or at least traits held in common with Mesopotamia. Among these are the Gilgamesh, Mesopotamian epic, 
motif of a man grappling with a pair of tigers and the bullman Enkidu, a human with horns, tail, and rear hooves of a bull. Among the most interesting of the seals are those that depict cult scenes or symbols, a god, seated in a yogic, meditative, posture and surrounded by beasts, with a horned headdress and erect phallus, the tree spirit with a tiger standing before it, the horn tree spirit confronted by a worshipper, a composite beast with a line of seven figures standing before it, the people leaf motif, and the swastika, a symbol still widely used by Hindus, Jains, and Buddhists. Many burials have been discovered, giving clear indication of belief in an afterlife. The cemeteries excavated at Harappa, Lot Howe, and Kalibangan are clearly separated from the settlement and show that the predominant rite was extended inhumation, with the body lying on its back and the head generally positioned to the north. Quantities of pottery were placed in the graves, and sometimes personal ornaments adorned the bodies. Some graves took the form of brick chambers within which the body was placed. At Lot Howe several pairs of skeletons were found in the same grave, and it has been suggested that this is an indication of some form of sati, a later Hindu custom in which wives end their lives after the death of the husband. The development of Indian civilization from c. 1500 BCE to c. 1200 CE. Traditional approaches to Indian historiography. The European scholars who reconstructed early Indian history in the 19th century regarded it as essentially static and Indian society as concerned only with things spiritual. Indologists, such as the German Max Muller, relied heavily on the Sanskritic tradition and saw Indian society as an idyllic village culture emphasizing qualities of passivity, meditation, and otherworldliness. In sharp contrast was the approach of the Scottish historian James Mill and the utilitarians, who condemned Indian culture as irrational and inimical to human progress. Mill first formulated a periodization of Indian history into Hindu, Muslim, and British periods, a scheme that, while still commonly used, is now controversial. During the 19th century, direct contact with Indian institutions through administration Together with the utilization of new evidence from recently deciphered inscriptions, numismatics, and local archives, provided fresh insights. Nationalist Indian historians of the early 20th century tended to exaggerate the glory of the past but nevertheless introduced controversy into historical interpretation, which in turn resulted in more precise studies of Indian institutions. In more recent times, historians have reconstructed in greater detail the social, economic, and cultural history of the subcontinent, though politics has continued to influence the study of Indian history. A major change in the interpretation of Indian history has been a questioning of an older notion of Oriental despotism as the determining force. Arising out of a traditional European perspective on Asia, this image of despotism grew to vast proportions in the 19th century and provided an intellectual justification for colonialism and imperialism. Its deterministic assumptions clouded the understanding of early interrelationships among Indian political forms, economic patterns, and social structures. Trends in early Indian society A considerable change is noticeable during this period in the role of institutions. Clan-based societies had assemblies, whose political role changed with the transformation of tribe into state and with oligarchic and monarchical governments. Centralized imperialism which was attempted under the Mauryan Empire, c. 325 to 185 BCE, gave way gradually to decentralized administration and to what has been called a feudalistic pattern in the post-Gupta period, i.e., from the 7th century CE. Although the village as an administrative and social unit remained constant, its relationship with the mainstream of history varied. The concept of divine kingship was known but rarely taken seriously, the claim to the status of the caste of royalty becoming more important. Because conformity to the social order had precedence over allegiance to the state, the idea of representation found expression not so much in political institutions as in caste and village assemblies. The pendulum of politics swung from large to small kingdoms, with the former attempting to establish empires, the sole successful attempt being that of the Mauryan dynasty. Thus, true centralization was rare, because local forces often determined historical events. 
Although imperial or near-imperial periods were marked by attempts at the evolution of uniform cultures, the periods of smaller kingdoms, often referred to as the Dark Ages by earlier historians, were more creative at the local level and witnessed significant changes in society and religion. These small kingdoms also often boasted the most elaborate and impressive monuments. The major economic patterns were those relating to land and to commerce. The transition from tribal to peasant society was a continuing process, with the gradual clearing of wasteland and the expansion of the village economy based on plough agriculture. Recognition of the importance of land revenue coincided with the emergence of the imperial system in the 4th century BCE, and from this period onward, although the imperial structure did not last long, land revenue became central to the administration and income of the state. Frequent mentions of individual ownership, references to crown lands, numerous land grants to religious and secular grantees in the post-Gupta period, and detailed discussion in legal sources of the rights of purchase, bequest, and sale of land all clearly indicate that private ownership of land existed. Much emphasis has been laid on the state control of the irrigation system, yet a systematic study of irrigation in India reveals that it was generally privately controlled and that it serviced small areas of land. See Hydraulic Civilization When the state built canals, they were mainly in the areas affected by both the winter and summer monsoons, in which village assemblies played a dominant part in revenue and general administration, as, for example, in the Kola, Chola, Kingdom of Southern India. The urban economy was crucial to the rise of civilization in the Indus Valley, circa 2600 to 2000 BCE. Later the first millennium BCE saw an urban civilization in the Ganges, Ganga, Valley and still later in coastal South India. The emergence of towns was based on administrative needs, the requirements of trade, and pilgrimage centers. In the first millennium CE, when commerce expanded to include trade with Western Asia, the Eastern Mediterranean, and Central and Southeast Asia, revenue from trade contributed substantially to the economies of the participating kingdoms, as indeed Indian religion and culture played a significant part in the cultural evolution of Central and Southeast Asia. Gold coins were issued for the first time by the Kushan dynasty and in large quantity by the Guptas, both kingdoms were active in foreign trade. Gold was imported from Central Asia and the Roman Republic and Empire and later perhaps from Eastern Africa because, in spite of India's recurring association with gold, its sources were limited. Expanding trade encouraged the opening up of new routes, and this, coupled with the expanding village economy, led to a marked increase of knowledge about the subcontinent during the post-Mauryan period. With increasing trade, guilds became more powerful in the towns. Members of the guilds participated in the administration, were associated with politics, and controlled the development of trade through merchant embassies sent to places as far afield as Rome and China. Not least, guilds and merchant associations held envied and respectable positions as donors of religious institutions. The structure of Indian society was characterized by caste. The distinguishing features of a caste society were endogamous kinship groups, jatis, arranged in a hierarchy of ritual ranking, based on notions of pollution and purity, with an intermeshing of service relationships and an adherence to geographic location. There was some coincidence between caste and access to economic resources. Although ritual hierarchy was unchanging, there appears to have been mobility within the framework. Migrations of peoples both within the subcontinent and from outside encouraged social mobility and change. The nucleus of the social structure was the family, with the pattern of kinship relations varying from region to region. In the more complex urban structure, occupational guilds occasionally took on jati functions, and there was a continual emergence of new social and professional groups. Religion in early Indian history did not constitute a monolithic force. Even when the royalty attempted to encourage certain religions, the idea of a state religion was absent. In the main, there were three levels of religious expression. The most widespread was the worship of local cult deities vaguely associated with major deities, as seen in fertility cults, in the worship of mother goddesses, in the Shakta Shakti cult, and in Tantrism. See Shaktism. Less widespread but popular, 
particularly in the urban areas, were the more puritanical sects of Buddhism and Jainism and the Bhakti tradition of Hinduism. A third level included classical Hinduism and more abstract levels of Buddhism and Jainism, with an emphasis on the major deities in the case of the first and on the teachings of the founders in the case of the latter two. It was this level, endorsed by affluent patronage, that provided the base for the initial institutionalization of religion. But the three levels were not isolated, the shadow of the third fell over the first two, the more homely rituals and beliefs of which often crept into the third. This was the case particularly with Hinduism, the very flexibility of which was largely responsible for its survival. Forms of Buddhism, ranging from an emphasis on the constant refinement of doctrine on the one hand to an incorporation of magical fertility cults in its beliefs on the other, faded out toward the end of this period. Sanskrit literature and the building of Hindu and Buddhist temples and sculpture both reached apogees in this period. Although literary works in the Sanskrit language continued to be written and temples were built in later periods, the achievement was never again as inspiring. From c. 1500 to c. 500 BCE. By about 1500 BCE an important change began to occur in the northern half of the Indian subcontinent. The Indus civilization had declined by about 2000 BCE, or perhaps as late as 1750 BCE, and the stage was being set for a second and more lasting urbanization in the Ganges Valley. The new areas of occupation were contiguous with and sometimes overlapping the core of the Harapan area. There was continuity of occupation in the Punjab and Gujarat, and a new thrust toward urbanization came from the migration of peoples from the Punjab into the Ganges Valley. Early Vedic Period In addition to the archaeological legacy discussed above, there remains from this period the earliest literary record of Indian culture, the Vedas. Composed in archaic, or Vedic, Sanskrit, generally dated between 1500 and 800 BCE, and transmitted orally, the Vedas comprise four major texts, the Rig Dash, the Sama Dash, the Yajur Dash, and the Atharva Veda. Of these, the Rigveda is believed to be the earliest. The texts consist of hymns, charms, spells, and ritual observations current among the Indo-European speaking people known as Aryans, from Sanskrit Arya, noble, who presumably entered India from the Iranian regions. Theories concerning the origins of the Aryans, whose language is also called Aryan, relate to the question of what has been called the Indo-European homeland. In the 17th and 18th centuries CE, European scholars who first studied Sanskrit were struck by the similarity in its syntax and vocabulary to Greek and Latin. This resulted in the theory that there had been a common ancestry for these and other related languages, which came to be called the Indo-European group of languages. This in turn resulted in the notion that Indo-European speaking peoples had a common homeland from which they migrated to various parts of Asia and Europe. The theory stirred intense speculation, which continues to the present day, regarding the original homeland and the period or periods of the dispersal from it. The study of Vedic India is still beset by, the Aryan problem, which often clouds the genuine search for historical insight into this period. That there was a migration of Indo-European speakers, possibly in waves, dating from the 2nd millennium BCE, is clear from archaeological and epigraphic evidence in Western Asia. Mesopotamia witnessed the arrival about 1760 BCE of the Kassites, who introduced the horse and the chariot and bore Indo-European names. A treaty from about 1400 BCE between the Hittites, who had arrived in Anatolia about the beginning of the second millennium BCE, and the Mitanni Empire invoked several deities, Indara, Yuruvna, Matira, and the Nasatyas, names that occur in the Rigveda as Indra, Varana, Mitra, and the Ashvans. An inscription at Bagas Khoi in Anatolia of about the same date contains Indo-European technical terms pertaining to the training of horses, which suggests cultural origins in Central Asia or the Southern Russian steppes. Clay tablets dating to about 1400 BCE, written at Tel El Amarna, in Upper Egypt, in Akkadian cuneiform, mention names of princes that are also Indo-European. Nearer India the Iranian plateau was subject to a similar migration. Comparison of Iranian Aryan literature with the Vedas reveal striking correspondences. 
Possibly a branch of the Iranian Aryans migrated to northern India and settled in the Saptas in the region, extending from the Kabul River in the north to the Sarasvati in Upper Ganges Yamuna Dobe in the south. The Sarasvati, the sacred river at the time, is thought to have dried up during the later Vedic period. Conceived as a goddess, see Sarasvati, it was personified in later Hinduism as the inventor of spoken and written Sanskrit and the consort of Brahma, promulgator of the Vedas. It was in the Saptas in the region that the majority of the hymns of the Rigveda were composed. The Rigveda is divided into ten mandalas, books, of which the tenth is believed to be somewhat later than the others. Each mandala consists of a number of hymns, and most mandalas are ascribed to priestly families. The texts include invocations to the gods, ritual hymns, battle hymns, and narrative dialogues. The ninth mandala is a collection of all the hymns dedicated to Soma, the unidentified hallucinogenic juice that was drunk on ritual occasions. Few events of political importance are related in the hymns. Perhaps the most impressive is a description of the battle of the ten chiefs or kings, when Sudas, the king of the preeminent Bharatas of southern Punjab, replaced his priest Vishvamitra with Vasishtha, Vishvamitra organized a confederacy of ten tribes, including the Puru, Yadu, Tervishas, Anu, and Druhu, which went to war against Sudas. The Bharata survived and continued to play an important role in historical tradition. In the Rigveda the head of a clan is called the Raja, this term commonly has been translated as, king, but more recent scholarship has suggested, chief, as more appropriate in this early context. If such a distinction is recognized, the entire corpus of Vedic literature can be interpreted as recording the gradual evolution of the concept of kingship from earlier clan organization. Among the clans there is little distinction between Aryan and non-Aryan, but the hymns refer to a people, called the Dasius, who are said to have had an alien language and a dark complexion and to worship strange gods. Some Dasius were rich in cattle and lived in fortified places, Puras, that were often attacked by the god Indra. In addition to the Dasius, there were the wealthy Panis, who were hostile and stole cattle. The early Vedic was the period of transition from nomadic pastoralism to settled village communities intermixing pastoral and agrarian economies. Cattle were initially the dominant commodity, as indicated by the use of the words gatra, kalpan, to signify the endogamous kinship group and gavishti, searching for cows, to denote war. A patriarchal extended family structure gave rise to the practice of nyoga, levirate, which permitted a widow to marry her husband's brother. A community of families constituted a grama. The term vish is generally interpreted to mean clan. Clan assemblies appear to have been frequent in the early stages. Various categories of assemblies are mentioned, such as Vidatha, Samadhi, and Sava, although the precise distinctions between these categories are not clear. The clan also gathered for the Yajna, the Vedic sacrifice conducted by the priest, whose ritual actions ensured prosperity and imbued the chief with valor. The chief was primarily a war leader with responsibility for protecting the clan, for which function he received a Bali, tribute. Punishment was exacted according to a principle resembling the Wurgild of ancient Germanic law, whereby the social rank of a wronged or slain man determined the compensation due him or his survivors. Later Vedic period, c. 800 c. 500 BCE. The principal literary sources from this period are the Sama Dash, the Yajur Dash, and the Atharvaveda, mainly ritual texts, the Brahmanas, manuals on ritual, and the Upanishads, Upanishads, and Aranyaka, collections of philosophical and metaphysical discourses. Associated with the corpus are the sutra texts, largely explanatory aids to the other works, comprising manuals on sacrifices and ceremonies, domestic observances, and social and legal relations. Because the texts were continually revised, they cannot be dated accurately to the early period. The Dharma Sutra texts of this period became the nuclei of the socio-legal Dharma Shastras of later centuries. Historians formerly assigned the two major Indian epics, the Mahabharata and the Ramayana, to this period, but subsequent scholarship has rendered these dates less certain. Both works are mixtures of the historical and the legendary, 
both were rewritten and edited, both suffered from frequent interpolations even as late as the early centuries CE, and both were later converted into sacred literature with the deification of their heroes. Consequently, important as they are to the literary and religious tradition, they are not easily identified with a historical period. The central event of the Mahabharata, whose geographic setting is the Upper Ganges, Yamuna Dobe and adjoining areas, is a war between two groups of cousins, the Kauravas and the Pandavas. Though the traditional date for the war is about 3102 BCE, most historians would prefer a later one. The events of the Ramayana relate to the Middle Ganges Valley and Central India, with later interpolations extending the area southward. The geographic focus of the later Vedic corpus moves from the Saptas in the region into the Ganges, Yamuna Dobe and the territories on its fringe. The areas within this land of the Aryas, called Aryavarta, were named for the ruling clans, and the area encompassed within Aryavarta gradually expanded eastward. By the end of the period, clan identity had changed gradually to territorial identity, and the areas of settlement came eventually to form states. The people beyond the area of Arda were termed the Mlekas, or Mlechchas, the impure barbarians unfamiliar with the speech and customs of the Aryas. The literature is replete with the names of clans. The most powerful among them, commanding the greatest respect, was the Kuru Pankala, which incorporated the two families of Kuru and Puru, and the earlier Bharatas, and of which By the Pankala the was a confederation BCE, of lesser-known tribes. Had changed to territorial they occupied the upper Ganges, Yamuna Dobe and the Kurukshetra region. Kingdoms in, some cases. in the north the Kamboja, the Gandhara, was emerging and Madra groups predominated. Assemblies such in the, the middle Sava Ganges Valley the neighbors and rivals of the Kuru Pankalas were the Kashi, periods. Kashala, and Videha, the who worked declined. in close cooperation with each other. Notions of the Magadha, the Anga, of and Vanga peoples in the lower the Rattan, Ganges Valley and Delta were, in that period, still outside the Aryan Pale and regarded chief. as Mlekas. A major transformation occurred in the notion of kingship, which ceased to be merely an office of a war leader. Territorial identity provided it with power and status, symbolized by a series of lengthy and elaborate ceremonies, the Abhisheka, generally followed by major sacrificial rituals, such as the Ashvamita. This ceremony was a famous horse sacrifice, in which a specially selected horse was permitted to wander at will, tracked by a body of soldiers, the area through which the horse wandered unchallenged was claimed by the chief or king conducting the sacrifice. Thus, theoretically at least, only those with considerable power could perform this sacrifice. Such major sacrificial rituals involved a large amount of wealth and a hierarchy of priests. The ceremonies lasted many days and involved a reciprocal economy of gift exchange between the chief and the priest, by which the latter received wealth in kind and the former established status, prosperity, and proximity to the gods. The conspicuous display and consumption of these ceremonies have elicited comparison with the potlatch of the Kwakiutl and related North American indigenous peoples. The assumption of such sacrifices was that the clan had settled in a particular area, marking the end of nomadism. This led eventually to the claim of ownership by kings of the wastelands, although a ruler's right to collect taxes was viewed not as a consequence of his ownership of wasteland but as his wage for protecting society. The new trends emphasized the importance of the priests and the aristocracy, Brahmins and Kshatriyas, who were the mainstay of kingship. The introduction, through royal sacrifices, of notions of divinity in kingship further strengthened the role of the priests. This was also the period in which kingship became hereditary. The technology of iron, or Krishna ayas, dark metal, as it was apparently called in later Vedic literature, and the migration into the Ganges Valley helped in stabilizing agriculture and settlements. Some of these settlements along the rivers evolved into towns, essentially as administrative and craft centers. By the mid-first millennium BCE the second urbanization, this time in the Ganges Valley, was underway. The development with the most far-reaching consequences for Indian culture is the structure of society that has come to be called caste. A hymn in the Rigveda contains a description of the primeval sacrifice and refers to the emergence of four groups from the body of the god Prajapati, the Brahmins, Burmas, Kshatriyas, Kshatriyas, Vaishyas, Vaishyas, and Sudras, Sudras. 
This is clearly a mythologized attempt to describe the origin of the four Varnas, which came to be regarded as the four major classes in Indian society. The etymology of each is of interest. Brahman is one who possesses magical or divine knowledge, Brahman, Kshatriya is endowed with power or sovereignty, Katra, and Vaishya, derived from Vis, Vish, settlement, is a person settled on the land or a member of the clan. The derivation of the term Sudra, however, denoting a member of the group born to serve the upper three Varnas, is not clear, which may suggest that it is a non-Aryan word. In addition to Varna there are references to Jati, birth, which gradually came to acquire a close association with caste and appears to mean the endogamous kinship group. In the course of time the Brahmins became the preeminent priestly group, the intermediaries with the gods at the sacrificial rituals, and the recipients of large donations for priestly functions, in the process they acquired a number of privileges, such as exemption from taxes and inviolability. The Kshatriyas, who were to become the landowning families, assumed the role of military leaders and of the natural aristocracy having connections with royalty. The Vaishyas were more subservient, and, although their status was not as inferior as that of the Sudras, they appear to have been crucial to the economy. The traditional view of the Sudras is that they were non-Aryan cultivators who came under the domination of the Aryans and in many cases were enslaved and therefore had to serve the upper three groups. But not all references to the Sudras are to slaves. Sometimes wealthy Sudras are mentioned, and in later centuries some of them even became kings. The traditional view that Varna reflects the organization of Indian society has recently been questioned, it has been suggested that the rules of Varna conform to a normative or presumptive model, and that the concept of Jati is more central to caste functioning. This view is strengthened by the fact that the non-Brahmanical literature of later periods does not always conform to the picture of caste society depicted in the Dharma Shastras. The beginning of the historical period, c. 500-150 BCE. Ashoka, Empire c. 250 BCE. Ashoka, Empire c. 250 BCE. Left, India c. 500 BCE and, right, Ashoka's empire at its greatest extent, c. 250 BCE. For this phase of Indian history a variety of historical sources are available. The Buddhist canon, pertaining to the period of the Buddha, c. 6th to 5th century BCE, and later, is invaluable as a cross-reference for the Brahmanic sources. This also is true, though to a more limited extent, of Jain sources. In the 4th century BCE there are secular writings on political economy and accounts of foreign travelers. The most important sources, however, are inscriptions of the 3rd century BCE. See Buddhism, Jainism, Primorian states. Buddhist writings and other sources from the beginning of this period mention 16 major states, Mahajanapada, dominating the northern part of the subcontinent. A few of these, such as Gandhara, Cambodia, Kurupankala, Matsya, Kashi, and Kashala, continued from the earlier period and are mentioned in Vedic literature. The rest were new states, either freshly created from declining older ones or new areas coming into importance, such as Avanti, Ashvaka, Shurasena, Vats, Sadi, Mulla, Vrigi, Magadha, and Anga. The mention of so many new states in the eastern Ganges Valley is attributable in part to the eastern focus of the sources and is partly the antecedent to the increasing preeminence of the eastern regions. Gandhara lay astride the Indus and included the districts of Peshawar and the lower Swat and Kabul valleys. For a while its independence was terminated by its inclusion as one of the 22 satrapies of the Achaemenian Empire of Persia, c. 519 BCE. Its major role as the channel of communication with Iran and Central Asia continued, as did its trade in woolen goods. Cambodia adjoined Gandhara in the northwest. Originally regarded as a land of Aryan speakers, Cambodia soon lost its important status, ostensibly because its people did not follow the sacred Brahmanic rites, a situation that was to occur extensively in the north as the result of the intermixing of peoples and cultures through migration and trade. Cambodia became a trading center for horses imported from Central Asia. The Kakayas, Madras, and Ashanaras, who had settled in the region between Gandhara and the Bias River, 
were described as descendants of the Anu tribe. The Matsyas occupied an area to the southwest of present-day Delhi. The Kurupankala, still dominant in the Ganges Yamuna Dobe area, were extending their control southward and eastward. The Kuru capital had reportedly been moved from Hastinapura to Kashambi when the former was devastated by a great flood, which excavations show to have occurred about the 9th century BCE. The Malas lived in eastern Uttar Pradesh. Avanti arose in the Ujjain-Nirmatha Valley region, with its capital at Mahishmati, during the reign of King Pradyota. There was a matrimonial alliance with the royal family at Kashambi. Shurasena had its capital at Mathura, and the tribe claimed descent from the Yudha clan. A reference to the Surasenwa in later Greek writings is often identified with the Shurasena and the city of Methora with Mathura. The Vat state emerged from Kashambi. The Sadi state, in Bundelkhand, lay on a major route to the Deccan. South of the Vindhyas, on the Godavari River, Ashvaka continued to thrive. The mid-Ganges valley was dominated by Kashi and Kashala. Kashi maintained close affiliations with its eastern neighbors, and its capital was later to acquire renown as the sacred city of Varanasi, Banaras. Kashi and Kashala were continually at war over the control of the Ganges, in the course of the conflict, Kashala extended its frontiers far to the south, ultimately coming to comprise Uttar, northern, and Dakshina, southern, Kashala. The new states of Magadha, Putna and Gaya districts, and Anga, northwest of the delta, were also interested in controlling the river and soon made their presence felt. The conflict eventually drew in the Vriji state, Behar and Muzaffarpur districts. For a while, Videha, modern Tirhut, with its capital at Midila, also remained powerful. References to the states of the northern Deccan appear to repeat statements from sources of the earlier period, suggesting that there had been little further exchange between the regions. Political systems The political system in these states was either monarchical or a type of representative government that variously has been called republican or oligarchic. The fact that representation in these latter states' assemblies was limited to members of the ruling clan makes the term oligarchy, or even chiefdom, preferable. Sometimes within the state itself there was a gradual change from monarchy to oligarchy, as in the case of Vaishali, the nucleus of the Vriji state. Apart from the major states, there also were many smaller oligarchies, such as those of the Kaliyas, Mariyas, Natrikas, Sakyas, and Lachavis. The Natrikas and Sakyas are especially remembered as the tribes to which Mahavira, the founder of Jainism, and Gautama Buddha, respectively, belonged. The Lachavis eventually became extremely powerful. The oligarchies comprised either a single clan or a confederacy of clans. The elected chief or the president, Gunpati or Ganaragia, functioned with the assistance of a council of elders probably selected from the Kshatriya families. The most important institution was the Sovereign General Assembly, or Paris had, to the meetings of which members were summoned by Kettledrum. Precise rules governed the seating arrangement, the agenda, and the order of speaking and debate, which terminated in a decision. A distinction was maintained between the families represented and the others. The broad authority of the Paris had included the election of important functionaries. An occasional lapse into hereditary office on the part of the chief may account for the tendency toward monarchy among these states. The divisiveness of factions was a constant threat to the political system. The institutional development within these oligarchies suggests a stabilized agrarian economy. Sources mention wealthy householders, gahapatis, employing slaves and hired laborers to work on their lands. The existence of gahapatis suggests the breaking up of clan ownership of land and the emergence of individual holdings. An increase in urban settlements and trade is evident not only from references in the literary sources but also from the introduction of two characteristics of urban civilization, a script and coinage. Evidence for the script dates at least to the 3rd century BCE. The most widely used script was Brahmi, which is germane to most Indian scripts used subsequently. A variant during this period was Karashti, used only in northwestern India and derived from the Aramaic of Western Asia. The most commonly spoken languages were Prakrit, which had its local variations in Shorasini, from which Pali evolved, and Magadhi, 
in which the Buddha preached. Sanskrit, the more cultured language as compared with Prakrit, was favored by the educated elite. Panini's grammar, the Astad Hayai, and Yaska's etymological work, the Nirukta, suggest considerable sophistication in the development of Sanskrit. Economy Silver bent bar coins and silver and copper punch marked coins came into use in the 5th century BCE. It is not clear whether the coins were issued by a political authority or were the legal tender of moneyers. The gradual spread in the same period of a characteristic type of luxury wear, which has come to be known as the northern black polished wear, is an indicator of expanding trade. One main trade route followed the Ganges River and crossed the Indogangetic watershed and the Punjab to Taxila and beyond. Another extended from the Ganges Valley via Ujjain and the Nirmada Valley to the western coast or, alternatively, southward to the Deccan. The route to the Ganges Delta became more popular, increasing maritime contact with ports on the eastern coast of India. The expansion of trade and consequently of towns resulted in an increase in the number of artisans and merchants, some eventually formed guilds, shrinis, each of which tended to inhabit a particular part of a town. The guild system encouraged specialization of labor and the hereditary principle in professions, which was also a characteristic of caste functioning. Gradually some of the guilds acquired caste status. The practice of usury encouraged the activity of financiers, some of whom formed their own guilds and found that investment in trade proved increasingly lucrative. The changed economy is evident in the growth of cities and of an urban culture in which such distinctions as Pura, walled settlement, Durga, fortified town, Nigama, market center, Nagara, town, and Mahanagara, city, became increasingly important. Religion the changing features of social and economic life were linked to religious and intellectual changes. Orthodox traditions maintained in certain sections of Vedic literature were questioned by teachers referred to in the Upanishads and Aranyaka and by others whose speculations and philosophy are recorded in other texts. There was a sizable heterodox tradition current in the 6th century BCE, and speculation ranged from idealism to materialism. The Ajivikas and the Karvakas, among the smaller sects, were popular for a time, as were the materialist theories of the Buddha's contemporary Ajita Keshikambalan. Even though such sects did not sustain an independent religious tradition, the undercurrent of their teachings cropped up time and again in the later religious trends that emerged in India. Of all these sects, only two, Jainism and Buddhism, acquired the status of major religions. The former remained within the Indian subcontinent, the latter spread to Central Asia, China, Korea, Japan, and Southeast Asia. Both religions were founded in the 6th to 5th century BCE, Mahavira gave shape to earlier ideas of the Nirgranthas, an earlier name for the Jains, and formulated Jainism, the teachings of the Jina, or conqueror, Mahavira, and the Buddha, the Enlightened One, preached a new doctrine. There were a number of similarities among these two sections. Religious rituals were essentially congregational. Monastic orders, the Sangha, were introduced with monasteries organized on democratic lines and initially accepting persons from all strata of life. Such monasteries were dependent on their neighborhoods for material support. Some of the monasteries developed into centers of education. The functioning of monks in society was greater, however, among the Buddhist orders. Wandering monks, preaching and seeking alms, gave the religions a missionary flavor. The recruitment of nuns signified a special concern for the status of women. Both religions questioned Brahmanical orthodoxy and the authority of the Vedas. Both were opposed to the sacrifice of animals, and both preached non-violence. Both derived support in the main from the Kshatriya ruling clans, wealthy Gahapadis, and the mercantile community, because trade and commerce did not involve killing, the principle of ahimsa, non-injury, could be observed in these activities. The Jains participated widely as the middlemen in financial transactions and in later centuries became the great financiers of Western India. While both religions disapproved in theory of the inequality of castes, neither directly attacked the assumptions of caste society, even so, they were able to secure a certain amount of support from lower caste groups, 
which was enhanced by the borrowing of rituals and practices from popular local cults. The patronage of women, especially those of royal families, was to become a noticeable feature. Magadhan Ascendancy Political activity in the 6th to 5th century BCE centered on the control of the Ganges Valley. The states of Kashi, Kashala, and Magadha and the Vrijis battled for this control for a century until Magadha emerged victorious. Magadha's success was partly due to the political ambition of its king, Bimbisara, c. 543-491 BCE. He conquered Anga, which gave him access to the Ganges Delta, a valuable asset in terms of the nascent maritime trade. Bimbisara's son Ajatashatru, who achieved the throne through patricide, implemented his father's intentions within about thirty years. Ajatashatru strengthened the defenses of the Magadhan capital, Rajagra, and built a small fort on the Ganges at Patalagrama, which was to become the famous capital Pataliputra, modern Putna. He then attacked and annexed Kashi and Kashala. He still had to subdue the confederacy of the Vriji state, and this turned out to be a protracted affair lasting sixteen years. Ultimately the Vrijis, including the important Lachavi clan, were overthrown, having been weakened by a minister of Ajatashatru, who was able to sow dissension in the confederacy. The success of Magadha was not solely attributable to the ambition of Bimbisara and Ajatashatru. Magadha had an excellent geographic location controlling the lower Ganges and thus drew revenue from both the fertile plain and the river trade. Access to the delta also brought in lucrative profits from the eastern coastal trade. Neighboring forests provided timber for building and elephants for the army. Above all, nearby rich deposits of iron ore gave Magadha a lead in technology. Bimbisara had been one of the After earliest the death Indian of kings Shatri, to emphasize C. efficient administration BCE, and the beginnings and a series of, of ineffectual rulers, took root. Sheshanaga found rudimentary dynasty, notions of land See, revenue Sheshanaga developed. Dynasty, which lasted Each for village had a headman century who was responsible for Mahapad collecting Mananda. taxes and another set of officials the Nandas are universally described as being of low the origin to the royal treasuries. But the full understanding Despite of these the rapidization of land changes, revenue as Magadha a major source of state state income strength. was yet to come. The Nandas the continuing of the earlier land continued of pace, expansion, but it is likely that they are primarily connected with wealth, small, probably because literary because they realized the importance of regular collection of another land long stretches campaigns of Alexander the Great. The northwestern part of India witnessed the military campaign of Alexander the Great of Macedon, who in 327 BCE, in pursuing his campaign to the eastern extremities of the Achaemenian Empire, entered Gandhara. He campaigned successfully across the Punjab as far as the Bias River, where his troops refused to continue fighting. The vast army of the Nandas is referred to in Greek sources, and some historians have suggested that Alexander's Macedonian and Greek soldiers may have mutinied out of fear of this army. The campaign of Alexander made no impression on the Indian mind, for there are no references to it in Indian sources. A significant outcome of his campaign was that some of his Greek companions, such as Onesicritus, Aristobulus, and his admiral, Nearchus, recorded their impressions of India. Later Greek and Roman authors such as Strabo and Arian, as well as Pliny and Plutarch, incorporated much of this material into their writings. However, some of the accounts are fanciful and make for better fiction than history. Alexander established a number of Greek settlements, which provided an impetus for the development of trade and communication with Western Asia. Most valuable to historians was a reference to Alexander's meeting the young prince Sandrokados, a name identified in the 18th century as Chandragupta, which provides a chronological landmark in early Indian history. The Mauryan Empire The accession of Chandragupta Maurya, reigned c. 321-297 BCE, is significant in Indian history because it inaugurated what was to become the first pan-Indian empire. The Mauryan dynasty was to rule almost the entire subcontinent, except the area south of present-day Karnataka, as well as substantial parts of present-day Afghanistan. Chandragupta Maurya Chandragupta overthrew the Nanda power in Magadha and then campaigned in central and northern India. Greek sources report that he engaged in a conflict in 305 BCE in the Trans-Indus region with Seleucus I Nicator, one of Alexander's generals, who, following the death of Alexander, 
had founded the Seleucid dynasty in Iran. The result was a treaty by which Seleucus ceded the Trans-Indus provinces to the Maurya and the latter presented him with 500 elephants. A marriage alliance is mentioned, but no details are recorded. The treaty ushered in an era of friendly relations between the Mauryas and the Seleucids, with exchanges of envoys. One among them, the Greek historian Megasthenes, left his observations in the form of a book, the Indica. Although the original has been lost, extensive quotations from it survive in the works of the later Greek writers Strabo, Diodorus, and Arian. A major treatise on political economy in Sanskrit is the Arthashastra of Kautilya, or Kanakya, as he is sometimes called. Kautilya, it is believed, was prime minister to Chandragupta, although this view has been contested. In describing an ideal government, Kautilya indicates contemporary assumptions of political and economic theory, and the description of the functioning of government occasionally tallies with present-day knowledge of actual conditions derived from other sources. The date of origin of the Arthashastra remains problematic, with suggested dates ranging from the 4th century BCE to the 3rd century CE. Most authorities agree that the kernel of the book was originally written during the early Maurian period but that much of the existing text is post-Mauryan. According to Jain sources, Chandragupta became a Jain toward the end of his reign. He abdicated in favor of his son Bindusara, became an ascetic, and traveled with a group of Jain monks to southern India, where he died, in the orthodox Jain manner, by deliberate slow starvation. Bindusara the second Maurayan emperor was Bindusara, who came to the throne about 297 BCE. Greek sources refer to him as a Mitrakates, the Greek for the Sanskrit Amitragata, destroyer of foes. This name perhaps reflects a successful campaign in the Deccan, Chandragupta having already conquered northern India. Bindusara's campaign stopped in the vicinity of Karnataka, probably because the territories of the extreme south, such as those of the Kolas, Pandyas, and Saras, were well disposed in their relations toward the Mauryas. Ashoka and his successors. Great Stupa. Great Stupa. Stupa 1, Great Stupa, Eastern Gateway, Sanchi, Madhya Pradesh, India, designated a World Heritage Site in 1989. Sanchi, Madhya Pradesh, India, Stupa number 2. Sanchi, Madhya Pradesh, India, Stupa number 2. Stupa number 2, Sanchi, Madhya Pradesh, India. Bindusara was succeeded by his son Ashoka, either directly in 272 BCE or, after an interregnum of four years, in 268 BCE, some historians say c. 265 BCE. Ashoka's reign is comparatively well documented. He issued a large number of edicts, which were inscribed in many parts of the empire and were composed in Prakrit, Greek, and Aramaic, depending on the language current in a particular region. Greek and Aramaic inscriptions are limited to Afghanistan and the Trans-Indus region. The first major event in Ashoka's reign, which he describes in an edict, was a campaign against Kalinga in 260 BCE. The suffering that resulted caused him to re-evaluate the notion of conquest by violence, and gradually he was drawn to the Buddhist religion. He built a number of stupas. About twelve years after his accession, he began issuing edicts at regular intervals. In one he referred to five Greek kings who were his neighbors and contemporaries and to whom he sent envoys, these were Antiochus II Theos of Syria, the grandson of Seleucus I, Ptolemy II Philadelphus of Egypt, Antigonus II Gonatas of Macedonia, Megas of Cyrene, and Alexander of either Epirus or Corinth. This reference has become the bedrock of Maurian chronology. Local tradition asserts that he had contacts with Khotan and Nepal. Close relations with Tissa, the king of Sri Lanka, were furthered by the fact that Mahinda, Ashoka's son, or his younger brother according to some sources, was the first Buddhist missionary on the island. Ashoka ruled for 37 years. After his death a political decline set in, and half a century later the empire was reduced to the Ganges Valley alone. Tradition asserts that Ashoka's son Kanala ruled in Gandhara. Epigraphic evidence indicates that his grandson Dashratha ruled in Magadha.
some historians have suggested that his empire was bifurcated. In 185 BCE the last of the Mauryas, Brihadratha, was assassinated by his Brahmin commander-in-chief, Pushyamitra, who founded the Shunga dynasty. Financial Base for the Empire The Mauryan achievement lay in the ability to weld the diverse parts of the subcontinent into a single political unit and to maintain an imperial system for almost 100 years. The financial base for an imperial system was provided by income from land revenue and, to a lesser extent, from trade. The gradual expansion of the agrarian economy and improvements in the administrative machinery for collecting revenue increased the income from land revenue. This is confirmed by both the theories of Caudalia and the account of Megasthenes. Caudalia maintained that the state should organize the clearing of wasteland and settle it with villages of Sudra cultivators. It is likely that some 150,000 persons deported from Kalinga by Ashoka after the campaign were settled in this manner. Migasthenes wrote that there were no slaves in India, yet Indian sources speak of various categories of slaves called dasas, the most commonly used designation being dasabratakas, slaves and hired laborers. It is likely that there was no large-scale slavery for production, although slaves were used on the land, in the mines, and in the guilds, along with the hired labor. Domestic slavery was common, however. The nature of land revenue has been a subject of controversy. Some scholars maintain that the state was the sole owner of the land, while others contend that there was private and individual ownership as well. References to private ownership would seem to be too frequent to be ignored. There also are references to the crown lands, the cultivation of which was important to the economy. Two types of taxes were levied one on the amount of land cultivated and the other on the produce of the land. The state maintained irrigation in limited areas and in limited periods. By and large, irrigation systems were privately controlled by cultivators and landowners. There is no support for a thesis that control of the hydraulic machinery was crucial to the political control of the country. Another source of income, which acquired increasing importance, was revenue from taxes levied on both internal and foreign trade. The attempt at improved political administration helped to break the economic isolation of various regions. Roads built to ensure quick communication with the local administration inevitably became arteries of exchange and trade. Marayan Society According to Migasthenes, Marayan society comprised seven occupational groups, philosophers, farmers, soldiers, herdsmen, artisans, magistrates, and counselors. He defined these groups as endogamous and the professions as hereditary, which has led to their being considered as castes. The philosophers included a variety of priests, monks, and religious teachers, they formed the smallest group but were the most respected, were exempt from taxation, and were the only ones permitted to marry into the other groups. The farmers were the largest group, the soldiers were highly paid, and, if Pliny's figures for the army are correct, 9,000 elephants, 30,000 cavalry, and 600,000 infantry, their support must have required a considerable financial outlay. The mention of herdsmen as a socio-economic group suggests that, although the agrarian economy was expanding and had become central to the state income, pastoralism continued to play an important economic role. The artisans probably represented a major section of the urban population. The listing of magistrates and counselors as distinct groups is evidence of a large and recognizable administrative personnel. Marayan Government the Maurian government was organized around the king. Ashoka saw his role as essentially paternal, all men are my children. He was anxious to be in constant touch with public opinion, and to this end he traveled extensively throughout his empire and appointed a special category of officers to gauge public opinion. His edicts indicate frequent consultations with his ministers, the ministerial council being a largely advisory body, the offices of the Sanat Hatri, treasurer, who kept the account, and the Samahartri, chief collector, who was responsible for revenue records, formed the hub of the revenue administration. Each administrative department, with its superintendents and subordinate officials, acted as a link between local administration and the central government. 
Kautilya believed that a quarter of the total income should be reserved for the salaries of the officers. That the higher officials expected to be handsomely paid is clear from the salaries suggested by Kautilya and from the considerable difference between the salary of a clerk, 500 panas, and that of a minister, 48,000 panas. Public works and grants absorbed another large percentage of state income. The empire was divided into four provinces, each under a prince or a governor. Local officials were probably selected from among the local populace, because no method of impersonal recruitment to administrative office is mentioned. Once every five years, the emperor sent officers to audit the provincial administrations. Some categories of officers in the rural areas, such as the rajukas, surveyors, combined judicial functions with assessment duties. Fines constituted the most common form of punishment, although capital punishment was imposed in extreme cases. Provinces were subdivided into districts and these again into smaller units. The village was the basic unit of administration and has remained so throughout the centuries. The headman continued to be an important official, as did the accountant and the tax collector, Stanika and Gopa, respectively. For the larger units, Kautilya suggests the maintenance of a census. Migasthenes describes a committee of 30 officials, divided into six subcommittees, who looked after the administration of Pataliputra. The most important single official was the city superintendent, Nagaraka, who had virtual control over all aspects of city administration. Centralization of the government should not be taken to imply a uniform level of development throughout the empire. Some areas, such as Magadha, Gandhara, and Avanti, were under closer central control than others, such as Karnataka, where possibly the Mauryan system's main concern was to extract resources without embedding itself in the region. It was against this background of imperial administration and a changing socio-economic framework that Ashoka issued edicts that carried his message concerning the idea and practice of Dhamma, the Prakrit form of the Sanskrit Dharma, a term that defies simple translation. It carries a variety of meanings depending on the context, such as universal law, social order, piety, or righteousness. Buddhists frequently used it with reference to the teachings of the Buddha. This in part colored the earlier interpretation of Ashoka's use of the word to mean that he was propagating Buddhism. Until his inscriptions were deciphered in 1837, Ashoka was practically unknown except in the Buddhist chronicles of Sri Lanka, the Mahavamsa and Dipavamsa, and the works of the Northern Buddhist tradition, the Divyavadana and the Ashokavadana, where he is extolled as a Buddhist emperor par excellence whose sole ambition was the expansion of Buddhism. Most of these traditions were preserved outside India in Sri Lanka, Central Asia, and China. Even after the edicts were deciphered, it was believed that they corroborated the assertions of the Buddhist sources, because in some of the edicts Ashoka avowed his personal support of Buddhism. However, more recent analyses suggest that, although he was personally a Buddhist, as his edicts addressed to the Buddhist Sangha attest, the majority of the edicts in which he attempted to define Dhamma do not suggest that he was merely preaching Buddhism. Ashoka addressed his edicts to the entire populace, inscribing them on rock surfaces or on specially erected and finely polished sandstone pillars, in places where people were likely to congregate. It has been suggested that the idea of issuing such decrees was borrowed from the Persian Achaemenian emperors, especially from Darius I, but the tone and content of Ashoka's edicts are quite different. Although the pillars, with their animal capitals, have also been described as imitations of Achaemenian pillars, there is sufficient originality in style to distinguish them as fine examples of Mauryan imperial art. The official emblem of India since 1947 is based on the four-lion capital of the pillar at Sarnath near Varanasi. The carvings contrast strikingly with the numerous small, grey terracotta figures found at urban sites, which are clearly expressions of Mauryan popular art. Ashoka defines the main principles of Dhamma as non-violence, tolerance of all sects and opinions, obedience to parents, respect for the Brahmins and other religious teachers and priests, liberality toward friends, humane treatment of servants, and generosity toward all. These suggest a general ethic of behavior to which no religious or social group could object. They also could act as a focus of loyalty to weld together the diverse strands that made up the empire. 
Interestingly, the Greek versions of these edicts translate Dhamma as Yuzabiya, piety, and no mention is made in the inscriptions of the teachings of the Buddha, which would be expected if Ashoka had been propagating Buddhism. His own activities under the impact of Dhamma included attention to the welfare of his subjects, the building of roads and rest houses, the planting of medicinal herbs, the establishment of centers for tending the sick, a ban on animal sacrifices, and the curtailing of killing animals for food. He also instituted a body of officials known as the Dhamma Mahamadas, who served the dual function of propagating the Dhamma and keeping the emperor in touch with public opinion. Maurayan Decline Some historians maintain that the disintegration of the Maurayan Empire was an aftermath of Ashoka's policies and actions and that his pro-Buddhist policy caused a revolt among the Brahmins. The edicts do not support such a contention. It has also been said that Ashoka's insistence on non-violence resulted in the emasculation of the army, which was consequently unable to meet the threat of invaders from the northwest. There is, however, no indication that Ashoka deliberately ignored the military wing of his administration, despite his emphasis on non-violence. Other explanations for the decline of the empire appear more plausible. Among these is the idea that the economy may have weakened, putting economic pressure on the empire. It has been thought that the silver currency of the Mauryas was debased as a result of this pressure. The expense required for the army and the bureaucracy must have tied up a substantial part of the income. It is equally possible that the expansion of agriculture did not keep pace with the expansion of the empire, and, because many areas were non-agricultural, the revenue from the agrarian economy may not have been sufficient for the maintenance of the empire. It is extremely difficult to compute the population of the empire, but a figure of approximately 50 million can be suggested. For a population of mixed agriculturalists and others to support an empire of this size would have been extremely difficult without intensive exploitation of resources. Relatively recent excavations at urban sites show a distinct improvement in material prosperity in the post-Mauryan levels. This may be attributable to an increase in trade, but the income from trade was unlikely to have been sufficient to supplement fully the land revenue in financing the empire. The concept of the state. Allegiance presupposes a concept of statehood. A number of varying notions had evolved by this time to explain the evolution of the state. Some theorists pursued the thread of the Vedic monarchies, in which the clan chief became the king and was gradually invested with divinity. An alternative set of theories arising out of Buddhist and Jain thought ignored the idea of divinity and assumed instead that, in the original state of nature, all needs were effortlessly provided but that slowly a decline set in and man became evil, developing desires, which led to the notions of private property and of family and finally to immoral behavior. In this condition of chaos, the people gathered together and decided to elect one among them, the Mahasamata, or, Great Elect, in whom they would invest authority to maintain law and order. Thus, the state came into being. Later theories retained the element of a contract between a ruler and the people. Brahmanic sources held that the gods appointed the ruler and that a contract of dues was concluded between the ruler and the people. Also prevalent was the theory of Matsyanyaya, which proposes that in periods of chaos, when there is no ruler, the strong devour the weak, just as in periods of drought big fish eat little fish. Thus, the need for a ruler was viewed as absolute. The existence of the state was primarily dependent on two factors, danda, authority, and dharma, in its sense of the social order, i.e., the preservation of the caste structure. The Arthashastra, moreover, refers to the seven limbs, septanga, of the state as the king, administration, territory, capital, treasury, coercive authority, and allies. However, the importance of the political notion of the state gradually began to fade, partly because of a decline of the political tradition of the republics and the proportional dominance of the monarchical system, in which loyalty was directed to the king. The emergence of the Maurayan Empire strengthened the political notion of monarchy. The second factor was that the Dharma, in the sense of the social order, demanded a far greater loyalty than did the rather blurred idea of the state. The king's duty was to protect dharma, and, as long as the social order remained intact, anarchy would not prevail. 
Loyalty to the social order, which was a fundamental aspect of Indian civilization, largely accounts for the impressive continuity of the major social institutions over many centuries. However, it also deflected loyalty from the political notion of the state, which might otherwise have permitted more frequent empires and a greater political consciousness. After the decline of the Mauryas, the re-emergence of an empire was to take many centuries. From 150 BCE to 300 CE. The disintegration of the Mauryan Empire gave rise to a number of small kingdoms, whose regional affiliations were often to be repeated in subsequent centuries. The Punjab and Kashmir regions were drawn into the orbit of Central Asian politics. The lower Indus Valley became a passage for movements from the north to the west. The Ganges Valley assumed a largely passive role except when faced with campaigns from the northwest. In the northern Deccan there arose the first of many important kingdoms that were to serve as the bridge between the north and the south. Kalinga was once more independent. In the extreme south the prestige and influence of the Sara, Kola, and Pandya kingdoms continued unabated. Yet in spite of political fragmentation, this was a period of economic prosperity, resulting partly from a new source of income, trade, both within the subcontinent and with distant places in Central Asia, China, the Eastern Mediterranean, and Southeast Asia. Rise of Small Kingdoms in the North In the adjoining area held by the Seleucids, Diodotus I, the Greek governor of Bactria, rose in rebellion against the Seleucid king Antiochus II Theos and declared his independence, which was recognized by Antiochus about 250 BCE. Parthia also declared its independence. Indo-Greek rulers. A later Bactrian king, Demetrius, reigned c. 190 c. 167 BCE, took his armies into the Punjab and finally down the Indus Valley and gained control of northwestern India. This introduced what has come to be called Indo-Greek rule. The chronology of the Indo-Greek rulers is based largely on numismatic evidence. Their coins were, at the start, imitations of Greek issues, but they gradually acquired a style of their own, characterized by excellent portraiture. The legend was generally inscribed in Greek, Brahmi, and Korasti. The best known of the Indo-Greek kings was Menander, recorded in Indian sources as Melinda, reigned 155 to 130 BCE. He is featured in the Buddhist text Melinda Panha, Questions of Melinda, written in the form of a dialogue between the king and the Buddhist philosopher Nagasena, as a result of which the king is converted to Buddhism. Menander controlled Gandhara and Punjab, although his coins have been found farther south. According to one theory, he may have attacked the Shungas in the Yamuna region and attempted to extend his control into the Ganges Valley, but, if he did so, he failed to annex the area. Meanwhile, in Bactria the descendants of the line of Eucratides, who had branched off from the original Bactrian line, now began to take an interest in Gandhara and finally annexed Kabul and the kingdom of Taxila. An important Prakrit inscription at Besnagar, Bilsa district, of the late 2nd century BCE, inscribed at the instance of Heliodorus, a Greek envoy of Antialcides of Taxila, records his devotion to the Vaishnava Vasudeva sect. Central Asian Rulers the Bactrian control of Taxila was disturbed by an intrusion of the Scythians, known in Indian sources as the Shakas, who established the Shaka Satrap. They had attacked the kingdom of Bactria and subsequently moved into India. The determination of the Han rulers of China to keep the Central Asian nomadic tribes, the Xiongnu, Wusun, and Yueji, out of China forced these tribes in their search for fresh pastures to migrate southward and westward, a branch of the Yueji the de Yueji, moved farthest west to the Aral Sea and displaced the existing Shakas, who poured into Bactria and Parthia. The Parthian king Mithridates II tried to hold them back, but after his death, 88 BCE, they swept through Parthia and continued into the Indus Valley. Among the early Shaka kings was Maz, or Moga, 1st century BCE, who ruled over Gandhara. The Shakas moved southward under pressure from the Pallavas, Parthians, who ruled briefly in northwestern India toward the end of the 1st century BCE, the reign of Gondophernes being remembered. At Mathura the Shaka rulers of note were Rajavala and Shodasa.
Ultimately the Shakas settled in western India and Malava and came into conflict with the kingdoms of the northern Deccan and the Ganges Valley, particularly during the reigns of Nahapana, Kashtana, and Rudrudman, in the first two centuries CE. Rudrudman's fame is recorded in a lengthy Sanskrit inscription at Junagadh, dating to 150 CE. Kujala Kadphises, the Ueji chief, conquered northern India in the first century CE. He was succeeded by his son Vima, after whom came Kanishk, the most powerful among the Kushan kings, as the dynasty came to be called. The date of Kanishk's accession is disputed, ranging from 78 to 248. The generally accepted date of 78 is also the basis for an era presumably started by the Shakas and used in addition to the Gregorian calendar by the present-day Indian government. The era, possibly commemorating Kanishk's accession, was widely used in Malava, Ujjain, Nepal, and Central Asia. The Kushan kingdom was essentially oriented to the north, with its capital at Purasapura, near present-day Peshawar, although it extended southward as far as Sanchi and into the Ganges Valley as far as Varanasi. Mathura was the most important city in the southern part of the kingdom. Kanishk's ambitions included control of Central Asia, which, if not directly under the Kushans, did come under their influence. Inscriptions fairly recently discovered in the Gilgit area further attest such Central Asian connections. Kanishk's successors failed to maintain Kushan power. The southern areas were the first to break away, and, by the middle of the 3rd century, the Kushans were left virtually with only Gandhara and Kashmir. By the end of the century they were reduced to vassalage by the king of the Persian Sasanian dynasty. Not surprisingly, administrative and political nomenclature in northern India at this time reflected that of Western and Central Asia. The Persian term for the governor of a province, Kshathrapavan, as used by the Achaemenians, was Hellenized into Satrap and widely used by these dynasties. Its Sanskrit form was Kshatrapa. The governors of higher status came to be called Mahakshatrapa, they frequently issued inscriptions reflecting whatever era they chose to follow, and they minted their own coins, indicating a more independent status than is generally associated with governors. Imperial titles also were taken by the Indo-Greeks, such as Basilius Basilian, King of Kings, similar to the Persian Shahanshah, of which the later Sanskrit form was Maharadat Hiraja. A title of Central Asian derivation was the Devaputra of the Kushans, which is believed to have come originally from the Chinese, Son of Heaven, emphasizing the divinity of kingship, oligarchies and kingdoms. Occupying the watershed between the Indus and Ganges valleys, Punjab and Rajasthan were the nucleus of a number of oligarchies, or tribal republics whose local importance rose and fell in inverse proportion to the rise and fall of larger kingdoms. According to numismatic evidence, the most important politically were the Adambaras, Arjunayanas, Malavas, Yaudhayas, Shibis, Kunandas, Trigardas, and Abhiras. The Arjunayanas had their base in the present-day Bharatparawar region. The Malavas appear to have migrated from the Punjab to the Jaipur area. Perhaps after the Indo-Greek invasions, they are associated with the Malava era, which has been identified with the Vikrama era, also known as the Krita era and dating to 58 BCE. It is likely that southern Rajasthan as far as the Nirmadha River and the Ujjain district was named Malva after the Malavas. Yadhya evidence is scattered over many parts of the Punjab and the adjoining areas of what is now Rajasthan and Uttar Pradesh, but during this period their stronghold appears to have been the Rohtak district, north of Delhi. The frequent use of the term Ghana, group, on Yadhya coins indicates an adherence to the tribal tradition. References to Shaiva deities, especially Kartikya or Skanda, the legendary son of Shiva, are striking. The Shibis also migrated from the Punjab to Rajasthan and settled at Madhyamaka, near Chittor, now Chittorgarger. See Shaivism. Coins of the Kunandas locate them in the Shiwalik range between the Yamuna and the Bias rivers. The Trigardas have been associated with the Chumba region of the upper Ravi river, but they also may have inhabited the area of Jalandhara in the plains. The Abhiras lived in scattered settlements in various parts of western and central India as far as the Deccan. Most of these tribes claimed descent from the ancient lineages of the Puranas, and some of them were later connected with the rise of Rajput dynasties. 
In addition to the oligarchies, there were small monarchical states, such as Ayodhya, Kashambi, and the scattered Naga kingdoms, the most important of which was the one at Padmavti, Gwalior. Ahikatra, now the Bareli district of Uttar Pradesh, was ruled by kings who bore names ending in the suffix Mitra. The Shunga Kingdom Magadha was the nucleus of the Shunga Kingdom, which succeeded the Maurayan. The kingdom extended westward to include Ujjain and Vidisha. The Shungas came into conflict with Vidarbha and with the Yavnas, who probably were Bactrian Greeks attempting to move into the Ganges Valley. The word Yavna derives from the Prakrit Yona, suggesting that the Ionians were the first Greeks with whom the Persians and Indians came into contact. In later centuries the name Yavna was applied to all peoples coming from Western Asia and the Mediterranean region, which included the Romans, Persians, and Arabs. The Shunga dynasty lasted for about one century and was then overthrown by the Brahmin minister Vasudeva, who founded the Kanva dynasty, which lasted 45 years and following which the Magadha area was of greatly diminished importance until the 4th century CE. Kalinga Kalinga rose to prominence under Karvela, dated with some debate to the 1st century BCE. Karvela boasts, perhaps exaggeratedly for a pious Jain, of successful campaigns in the western Deccan and against the Yavnas and Magadha and of a triumphal victory over the Pandyas of southern India. The Andras and their successors. The Andras are listed among the tribal peoples in the Maurayan Empire. Possibly they rose to being local officials and then, on the disintegration of the empire, gradually became independent rulers of the northwestern Deccan. It cannot be ascertained for certain whether the Andras arose in the Andhra region, i.e., the Krishna Godavari deltas, and moved up to the northwestern Deccan or whether their settling in the delta gave it their name. There is also controversy as to whether the dynasty became independent at the end of the 3rd century BCE or at the end of the 1st century BCE. Their alternative name, Satavahana, is presumed to be the family name, whereas Andhra was probably that of the tribe. It is likely that Satavahana power was established during the reign of Shatakarni I, with the borders of the kingdom reaching across the northern Deccan. Subsequent to this the Satavahana dynasty suffered an eclipse in the 1st century CE, when it was forced out of the northern Deccan by the Shakas and resettled in Andhra. In the 2nd century CE the Satavahanas re-established their power in the northwestern Deccan, as evidenced by Shaka coins from this region overstruck with the name Gautamiputra Shatakarni. That the Andras did not control Maleva and Ujjain is clear from the claim of the Shaka king Rudrudman to these regions. The last of the important Andhra kings was Yajnashri Shatakarni, who ruled at the end of the 2nd century CE and asserted his authority over the Shakas. The 3rd century saw the decline of Satavahana power, as the kingdom broke into small pockets of control under various branches of the family. The Satavahana feudatories then rose to power. The Abhiras were the successors in the Nashik area. The Iksvaku succeeded in the Krishna Guntur region. The Kuta dynasty in Kunthala, southern Maharashtra, had close connections with the Satavahanas. The Bodhis ruled briefly in the northwestern Deccan. The Brihadphalayanas came to power at the end of the 3rd century in the Masulipatam area. In these regions the Satavahana pattern of administration continued, many of the rulers had matronymics, names derived from that of the mother or a maternal ancestor, many of the royal inscriptions record donations made to Buddhist monks and monasteries, often by princesses, and also land grants to Brahmins and the performance of Vedic sacrifices by the rulers. Southern Indian Kingdoms Significant, historically attested contact between the north and the Tamil regions can be reasonably dated to the Maurayan period. Evidence on the early history of the south consists of the epigraphs of the region, the Tamil Kan Kam, Sangam, literature, and archaeological data. Inscriptions in Brahmi, recently read as Tamil Brahmi, date to between the 2nd century BCE and the 4th century CE. Most of the inscriptions record donations made by royalty or by merchants and artisans to Buddhist and Jain monks. These are useful in corroborating evidence from the Kan Kam literature, a collection of a large number of poems in classical Tamil that, according to tradition, were recited at three assemblies of poets held at Madurai. 
Included in this literature are the eight anthologies, Etotokai, and ten idols, Patapatu. The grammatical work Tolkapiam also is said to be of the same period. The literature probably belongs to the same period as the inscriptions, although some scholars suggest an earlier date. The historical authenticity of sections of the Kamkam literature has been confirmed by archaeological evidence. Tamalakam, the abode of the Tamils, was defined in Kamkam literature as approximately equivalent to the area south of present-day Chennai, Madras. Tamalakam was divided into 13 Nadus, districts, of which the region of Madurai was the most important as the core of the Tamil speakers. The three major chiefdoms of Tamalakam were those of the Pandya dynasty, Madurai, the Saras, Cheras, Malabar coast and the hinterland, and the Kolas, Cholas, Tunjavur and the Kaveri valley, founders of the Kola dynasty. The inscriptions of the Pandyas, recording royal grants and other grants made by local citizens, date to the 2nd century BCE. The chief Nedunjelian, early 3rd century CE, is celebrated by the poets of the Kankam as the victor in campaigns against the Saras and the Kolas. Sara inscriptions of the 2nd century CE referring to the Arumparai clan have been found near Karur, Tirukkarappalli district, identified with the Karura of Ptolemy. Kankam literature mentions the names of Sara chiefs who have been dated to the 1st century CE. Among them, Nadundral Adan is said to have attacked the Yavna ships and held the Yavna traders to ransom. His son Shengudavan, much eulogized in the poems, also is mentioned in the context of Gajabahu's rule in Sri Lanka, which can be dated to either the first or last quarter of the second century CE, depending on whether he was the earlier or the later Gajabahu. Karaklan, late second century CE, is the best known of the early Kola chiefs and was to become almost a kind of eponymous ancestor to many families of the south claiming Kola descent. The early capital was at Ureir, in an area that stretched from the Vaigai River in the south to Tondamandalam in the north. The three chiefdoms were frequently at war, in addition there were often hostilities with Sri Lanka. Mention is also made of the ruler of Tondamandalam with its capital at Kanchipuram. There is also frequent mention of the minor chieftains, the Vel, who ruled small areas in many parts of the Tamil country. Ultimately all the chiefdoms suffered at the hands of the Kalvar, or Calabras, who came from the border to the north of Tamilakam and were described as evil rulers, but they were overthrown in the 5th century CE with the rise of the Kalukya, Kalukyas, and Pallava dynasties. Contacts with the West Numerous sources from the 1st millennium BCE mention trade between Western Asia and the western coast of India. Hebrew texts refer to the port of Ophir, sometimes identified with Sapera, on the west coast. Babylonian builders used Indian teak and cedar in the 7th and 6th centuries BCE. The Buddhist Jataka literature mentions trade with Bavru, Babylon. After the decline of Babylon, Arab merchants from southern Arabia apparently continued the trade, probably supplying goods to Egypt and the eastern Mediterranean. The discovery of the regular seasonal monsoon winds, enabling ships to sail a straight course across the Arabian Sea, made a considerable difference to shipping and navigation on the route from Western Asia to India. Unification of the Mediterranean and Western Asian world at the turn of the Christian era under the Roman Empire brought Roman trade into close contact with India, overland with northern India and by sea with peninsular India. The Emperor Augustus received two embassies, almost certainly trade missions, from India in 25 to 21 BCE. The Periplus Maris Erythrii, navigation of the Erythrean, i.e., Red, Sea, an anonymous Greek travel book written in the 1st century CE, lists a series of ports along the Indian coast, including Mazyris, Kranganor, Kalchi, Korkai, Paduka, and Sapatna. An excavation at Arakamidu, near present-day Puducherry, Pondicherry, revealed a Roman trading settlement of this period, and elsewhere to the presence of Roman pottery, beads, intaglios, lamps, glass, and coins point to a continuous occupation, resulting even in imitations of some Roman items. It would seem that textiles were prepared to Roman specification and exported from such settlements. Graffiti on pottery found at a port in the Red Sea indicates the presence of Indian traders. 
large hordes of Roman coins substantiate other evidence. The coins are mainly of the emperors Augustus, reigned 27 BCE-14 CE, Tiberius, reigned 14 to 37, and Nero, reigned 54 to 68. Their frequency suggests that the Romans paid for the trade in gold coins. Many are overstruck with a bar, which may indicate that they were used as bullion in India, certainly. The Roman savant Pliny the Elder complained that the Indian luxury trade was depleting the Roman treasury. The coins are found most often in trading centers or near the sources of semi-precious stones, especially quartz and beryl. Kankam literature attests the prosperity of Yavna merchants trading in towns such as Kaveri Patinam, in the Kaveri Delta. The Periplus lists the major exports of India as pepper, precious stones, pearls, tortoise shells, ivory, such aromatic plants as spikenard, Nardostikis jadamansi, and malabathrum, Cinnamomum malabathrum, and silk and other textiles. For these the Romans traded glass, copper, tin, lead, realgar, a red pigment, orpiment, a gold pigment, antimony, and wine, or else they paid in gold coins. The maritime trade routes from the Indian ports were primarily to the Persian Gulf and the Red Sea, from where they went overland to the eastern Mediterranean and to Egypt, but Indian merchants also ventured out to Southeast Asia seeking spices and semi-precious stones. River valleys and the Maurian roads were the chief routes within India. Greek sources refer to a royal highway built by the Mauryas, connecting Taxila with Pataliputra and terminating at Tamralipti, the main port in the Ganges Delta. On the western coast the major port of Brigakacha, modern Budoch, was connected with the Ganges Valley via Rajasthan or, alternatively, Ujjain. From the Nirmatha Valley there were routes going into the northwestern Deccan and continuing along rivers flowing eastward to various parts of the peninsula. Goods were transported mainly in caravans of oxen and donkeys, but only in the dry seasons, the rains creating impossible conditions for travel. Coastal and river shipping was clearly cheaper than overland transport. The main northern route connected Taxila with Kabul and Kandahar and from there branched off in various directions, mainly linking up with routes across Persia to the Black Sea ports and the eastern Mediterranean. The route connecting China with Bactria via Central Asia, which would shortly become famous as the Silk Road, linked the oases of Kashgar, Yarkand, Khotan, Miran, Kutcha, Karashar, and Turfan, in all of which Indian merchants established trading stations. The Central Asian route brought Chinese goods in large quantities into the Indian and Western Asian markets. It is thought that the prosperity resulting from this trade enabled the Kushans to issue the first Indian gold coins. Another consequence was the popularity of horsemanship. Society and Culture The commercial economy played a central role during this period. Circuits of exchange developed at various levels among groups throughout the subcontinent. In some regions these patterns extended to external trade. Agrarian expansion was not arrested, and land revenue continued to be a major source of income, but profit from trade made a substantial difference to the urban economy, noticeably improving the standard of living and registering a growth in the number and size of towns. Guilds The social institution most closely related to commercial activity was the Shrini, or guild, through which trade was channeled. The guilds were registered with the town authority, and the activities of guild members followed strict guidelines called the Srini Dharma. The wealthier guilds employed slaves and hired laborers in addition to their own artisans, though the percentage of such slaves appears to have been small. Guilds had their own seals and insignia. They often made lavish donations to Buddhist and Jain monasteries, and some of the finest Buddhist monuments of the period resulted from such patronage. In some areas, such as the Deccan, members of the royal family invested money with a particular guild, and the accruing interest became a regular donation to the Buddhist Sangha. This must also have enhanced the political prestige of the guild. Finance Increasing reliance on money in commerce greatly augmented the role of the financier and banker. Sometimes the wealthier guilds offered financial services, but the more usual source of money was the merchant financier, Shrestan. Coinage proliferated in the various kingdoms, and minting attained a high level of craftsmanship. 
The most widely used coins were the gold denarius and savarnas, based on the Roman denarius, 124 grains, about 8 grams, a range of silver coins, such as the earlier karshapana, or panna, 57.8 grains, 3.75 grams, and the shatamana, an even wider range of copper coins, such as the masa, kakani, and a variety of unspecified standards, and other coins issued in lead and paten particularly in western India. Usury was an accepted part of the banker's trade, with 15% being the typical interest rate, although this varied according to the enterprise for which the money was borrowed. Expanding trade also introduced a multiplicity of weights and measures. Impact of trade Foreign trade probably had its greatest economic impact in the south, but the interchange of ideas appears to have been more substantial in the north. This latter effect may have been attributable to the North's longer association with Western Asia and the colonial Hellenic culture. Greek, along with Aramaic, was widely spoken in Afghanistan and was doubtless understood in Taxila. The spurt of geographic studies in the Mediterranean produced works with extensive descriptions of the trade with India, these include Strabo's Geography, Ptolemy's Geography, Pliny's Natural History, and the Periplus Maris Erythriae. The most obvious and visible impact occurred in Gandhara art, which depicted Indian themes influenced by Hellenistic and Roman styles, an attractive hybrid that influenced the development of Buddhist iconography. The more prized among objects were the ivory carvings that reached Afghanistan from central India. If art remains are an index to patronage, then Buddhism seems to have been the most favored religion, followed by Shaivism and the Bhagavata cult. Buddhist centers generally comprised a complex of three structures, the monastery, vihara, the hall of worship, kaitya, and the sacred tumulus, stupa, all of which were freestanding structures in the north but were initially rock-cut monuments in the Deccan. The Jains found more patrons in the Deccan. Literary sources of the period mention Hindu temples, but none of comparable antiquity have been found. Apart from the Gandhara style of sculpture, a number of indigenous centers in other parts of India, such as Mathura, Karli, Nagarjunakonda, and Amaravati, portrayed Buddhist legends in a variety of local stones. The more popular medium was terracotta, by then changed from grey to red, depicting not only ordinary men and women and animal figures but also large numbers of mother goddesses, indicating the continued popular worship of these deities, from 300 to 750 CE. Northern India The Guptas Gupta Dynasty, Empire in 4th Century Gupta Dynasty, Empire in 4th Century The Gupta Empire at the end of the 4th Century Historians once regarded the Gupta period, c. 320-540, as the classical age of India, the period during which the norms of Indian literature, art, architecture, and philosophy were established. It was also thought to have been an age of material prosperity, particularly among the urban elite and of renascent Hinduism. Some of these assumptions have been questioned by more extensive studies of the post-Mauryan, pre-Gupta period. Archaeological evidence from the earlier Kushan levels suggests greater material prosperity, to such a degree that some historians argue for an urban decline in the Gupta period. Much of Gupta literature and art derived from that of earlier periods, and Renaissance Hinduism is probably more correctly dated to the post-Gupta time. The Gupta realm, although less extensive than that of the Mauryas, did encompass the northern half and central parts of the subcontinent. The Gupta period also has been called an imperial age, but the administrative centralization so characteristic of an imperial system is less apparent than during the Mauryan period. The Guptas, a comparatively unknown family, came from either Magadha or eastern Uttar Pradesh. The third king, Chandra Gupta I, reigned c. 320 c. 330, took the title of Maharajat Hiraja. He married a Lachavi princess, an event celebrated in a series of gold coins. It has been suggested that, if the Guptas ruled in Prayaga, present-day Prayagraj in eastern Uttar Pradesh, the marriage alliance may have added Magadha to their domain. The Gupta era began in 320 but it is not clear whether this date commemorated the accession of Chandra Gupta or the assumption of the status of independence. Chandra Gupta appointed his son Samudra Gupta, 
reigned c. 330 c. 380, to succeed him about 330, according to a long eulogy to Samudra Gupta inscribed on a pillar at Prayagraj. The coins of an obscure prince, Kacha, suggest that there may have been contenders for the throne. Samudra Gupta's campaigns took him in various directions and resulted in many conquests. Not all the conquered regions were annexed, but the range of operations established the military prowess of the Guptas. Samudra Gupta acquired Pataliputra, present-day Patna, which was to become the Gupta capital. Proceeding down the eastern coast, he also conquered the states of Dakshinapatha but reinstated the vanquished rulers. Among those he rendered subservient were the rulers of Aryavarta, various forest chiefs, the northern oligarchies, and border states in the east, in addition to Nepal. More distant domains brought within Samudra Gupta's orbit were regarded as subordinate. These comprised the King of Kings of the Northwest, the Shakas, the Murundas, and the inhabitants of all the islands, including Sinhala, Sri Lanka, all of which are listed in the inscription at Prayagraj. It would seem that the campaign extended Gupta power in northern and eastern India and virtually eliminated the oligarchies and the minor kings of central India and the Ganges Valley. The identity of the islands remains problematic, as they could either have been the ones close to India or those of Southeast Asia, with which communication had increased. The Ganges Valley and central India were the areas under direct administrative control. The campaign in the eastern coastal areas may have been prompted by the desire to acquire the trading wealth of these regions. The grim image of Samudra Gupta as a military conqueror is ameliorated, however, by references to his love of poetry and by coins on which he is depicted playing the lyre. Samudra Gupta was succeeded about 380 by his son Chandra Gupta II, reign c. 380 c. 415 though there is some evidence that there may have been an intermediate ruler. Chandra Gupta II's major campaign was against the Shaka rulers of Ujjain, the success of which was celebrated in a series of silver coins. Gupta interest lay not merely in the political control of the West but in the wealth the area derived from trade with Western and Southeastern Asia. Gupta territory adjoining the northern Deccan was secured through a marriage alliance with the Vakataka dynasty, the successors of the Satavahanas in the area. Although Chandra Gupta II took the title of Vikramaditya, son of valor, his reign is associated more with cultural and intellectual achievements than with military campaigns. His Chinese contemporary Faxian, a Buddhist monk, traveled in India and left an account of his impressions. Administratively, the Gupta kingdom was divided into provinces called Deshas or Bhaktis, and these in turn into smaller units, the Pradeshas or Vishayas. The provinces were governed by Kumaramadiyas, high imperial officers or members of the royal family. A decentralization of authority is evident from the composition of the municipal board, Adhishthana Adhikarana, which consisted of the guild president, Nagara Shreshthan, the chief merchant, Sarthava, and representatives of the artisans and of the scribes. During that period the term Samanta, which originally meant neighbor, was beginning to be applied to intermediaries who had been given grants of land or to conquered feudatory rulers. There was also a noticeable tendency for some of the higher administrative offices to become hereditary. The lack of firm control over conquered areas led to their resuming independence. The repeated military action that this necessitated may have strained the kingdom's resources. The first hint of a fresh invasion from the northwest comes in the reign of Chandra Gupta's son and successor, Kamara Gupta, reigned c. 415-455. The threat was that of a group known in Indian sources as the Hunas, or Huns, though it is not clear whether this group had any relations to the Huns of European history. They were in any event a branch of a Central Asian group known as the Hephthalites. Skanda Gupta, c. 455-467, who succeeded Kamara Gupta, and his successors all had to face the full-fledged invasion of the Hunas. Skanda Gupta managed to rally Gupta's strength for a while, but after his death the situation deteriorated. Dissensions within the royal family added to the problem. Gupta genealogies of this period show considerable variance in their succession lists. By the mid-6th century, when the dynasty apparently came to an end, the kingdom had dwindled to a small size. 
northern India and parts of central India were in the hands of the Hunas. The first Huna king in India was Toramana, early 6th century, whose inscriptions have been found as far south as Aran, Madhya Pradesh. His son Miharakula, a patron of Shaivism, is recorded in Buddhist tradition as uncouth and extremely cruel. The Gupta rulers, together with Yashadharman of Maleva, seem to have confronted Miharakula and forced him back to the north. Ultimately his kingdom was limited to Kashmir and Punjab with its capital at Shakala, possibly present-day Sialkot. Huna power declined after his reign. The coming of the Hunas brought northern India once more into close contact with Central Asia, and a number of Central Asian tribes migrated into India. It has been suggested that the Gurjaras, who gradually spread to various parts of northern India, may be identified with the Khazars, a Turkic people of Central Asia. The Huna invasion challenged the stability of the Gupta kingdom, even though the ultimate decline may have been caused by internal factors. A severe blow was the resultant disruption of the Central Asian trade and the decline in the income that northern India had derived from it. Some of the North Indian tribes migrated to other regions, and this movement of peoples affected changes in the social structure of the post-Gupta period. The rise of Rajput families and Kshatriya dynasties see below the Rajputs, is associated by some scholars with tribal chiefs in these new areas. Successor States Of the kingdoms that arose as inheritors of the Gupta territory, the most important were those of Vallabhi, Saurashtra and Kadiawar, Gujarata, originally the area near Jodhpur, believed to be the nucleus of the later Pratihara kingdom, Nandapuri, near Budoch, Maukari, Magadha, the kingdom of the later Guptas, in the area between Maleva and Magadha, and those of Bengal, Nepal, and Kamarupa, in the Assam Valley. Orissa, Kangoda, was under the Mana and Shailad Bhava dynasties before being conquered by Shashanka, king of Gauda, Lower Bengal. In the early 7th century Shashanka annexed a substantial part of the Ganges Valley, where he came into conflict with the Makaris and the rising Puspabudi, Pushyabudi, dynasty of Thanesar, north of Delhi. In the 8th century the rising power in western India was that of the Gurjara Pratiharas. The Rajput dynasty of the Gahila had its center in Mur, with Chittor as its base. The Kappa family was associated with the city of Anahilapataka, present-day Patan, and are involved in early Rajput history. In the Haryana region the Tamara Rajputs, Tamara dynasty, originally feudatories of the Gurjara Pratiharas, founded the city of Dilika, modern Delhi, in 736. The political pattern of this time reveals a rebirth of regionalism and of new political and economic structures. In the early 8th century a new power base was established briefly with the arrival of the Arabs in Sindh. Inscriptions of the Western Indian dynasties speak of controlling the tide of the Mleka, which has been interpreted in this case to mean the Arabs, some Indian sources use the TRM Yavna. The conquest of Sindh marked the easternmost extent of Arab territorial control. A 13th century Persian translation of a chronicle from Sindh, the Chachnami, gives an account of these events. The initial naval expedition met with failure, so the Arabs conducted an overland campaign. The Arab hold on Sindh was loose at first, and the local chiefs remained virtually independent, but by 724 the invaders had established direct rule, with a governor representing the Muslim caliph. Arab attempts to advance into Punjab and Kashmir, however, were checked. The Indians did not fully comprehend the magnitude of Arab political and economic ambitions. Along the west coast, the Arabs were seen as familiar traders from Western Asia. The possible competition with Indian trade was not realized. The Deccan in the Deccan the Vakataka dynasty was closely tied to the Guptas, with a nucleus in Vidarbha, the founder of the dynasty, Vindhya Shakti, extended his power northward as far as Vidisha, near Ujjain. At the end of the 4th century, a collateral line of the Vakatakas was established by Sarvasena in Batsagoma, Basin, in Akola district, and the northern line helped the southern to conquer Kunthala, southern Maharashtra.
The domination of the northern Deccan by the main Vakataka line during this period is clearly established by the matrimonial alliances not only with the Guptas but also with other peninsular dynasties such as the Visnakundans and the Kadambas. The Vakatakas were weakened by attacks from Maleva and Kashala in the 5th century. Ultimately, the Kalukyas of Vatapi, present-day Budami, ended their rule. Of the myriad ruling families of the Deccan between the 4th and 7th centuries, including the Nalas, the Kalakiris, the Gangas, and the Kadambas, the most significant were the Kalukyas, Kalukyas, who are associated with Vatapi in the 6th century. The Kalukyas controlled large parts of the Deccan for two centuries. There were many branches of the family, the most important of which were the eastern Kalukyas, ruling at Pishtapura, modern Pithapuram in the Godavari River Delta, in the early 7th century, the Kalukyas of Vemulavada, near Karimnagar, Andhra Pradesh, and the renascent later Kalukyas of Kalyani, between the Bhima and Godavari rivers, who rose to power in the 10th century. Kalukya power reached its zenith during the reign of Kulakshin II, 610-642, a contemporary of Harsha, see above successor states. The early years of Kulakshin's reign were taken up with a civil war, after which he had to reconquer lost territories and re-establish his control over recalcitrant feudatories. Kulakshin then campaigned successfully in the south against the Kadambas, the Alupas, and the Gangas. Leading his armies north, he defeated the Ladas, Malavas, and Gurjaras. Pulakshin's final triumph in the north was the victory over Harsha of Kunnaj. Pulakshin then turned his attention to the eastern Deccan and conquered southern Kashala, Kalinga, Pishtapuram, and the Vishnakundan kingdom. He started the collateral branch of the eastern Kalukyas based at Pishtapuram with his younger brother Vishnavradna as the first king. Pulakshin then launched another major campaign against the powerful southern Indian kingdom of the Pallavas, in which he defeated their king Mahendravraman I, thus inaugurating a conflict between the two kingdoms that was to continue for many centuries. Pulakshin II sent an embassy to the court of the Sasanian Persian king Khosro II. Good relations between the Persians and the Indians of the Deccan were of great advantage to the Zoroastrians of Persia, fleeing from the Islamic persecution in subsequent centuries, sought asylum in India and settled along the west coast of the Deccan. Their descendants today constitute the Parsi community. Control over both coasts enhanced the Kalukya king's already firm hold on the Deccan. The major river valleys of the plateau, the Nirmatha, Tapi, Tapti, Godavari with its tributaries, and Krishna, were in Kalukya hands, as were the valuable routes in the valleys. This amounted to control of the West Coast trade with Western Asia and the Kalinga and Andhra trade on the East Coast with Southeast Asia. The centuries-long conflict between the Northern and the Southern Deccan, of which the Kalukya-Pallava conflict was but a facet, also had geographic, political, and economic causes. Any Southern Indian power seeking to expand would inevitably try to move up the East Coast which was not only the most fertile area of the peninsula but was also wealthy from the income of trade with Southeast Asia. Therefore, control of the northern Deccan required control of the east coast as well. With the major maritime activity gradually concentrating on Southeast Asian trade, in which even the west coast had a large share, the control of both coasts was of considerable economic advantage. It was along the east coast, therefore, that the conflict between the two regions often erupted. The next 100 years of Kalukya power witnessed the continuation of this conflict, weakening both contenders. Ultimately, in the mid-8th century, a feudatory of the Kalukyas, Dantadurga of the Rashtrakuta dynasty, rose to importance and established himself in place of the declining Kalukya dynasty. The eastern Kalukyas, who had managed to avoid involvement in the conflict, survived longer and came into conflict with the Rashtrakutas. Another branch of the Kalukyas established itself at Lata in the mid-7th century and played a prominent role in obstructing the Arab advance. Southern India The southern part of the peninsula split into many kingdoms, each fighting for supremacy. Sarah power relied mainly on a flourishing trade with Western Asia. The Kolas retired into insignificance in the Uraer, Tiruchirappalli, area. The Pandyas were involved in fighting the rising power of the Pallavas, 
and occasionally they formed alliances with the Deccan kingdoms. The origin of the Pallava dynasty is obscure. It is not even clear whether the early Pallavas of the 3rd century were the ancestors of the later Pallavas of the 6th century, who are sometimes distinguished by the title, Imperial. It would seem, though, that their place of origin was Tondamandalam, with its center at Kanchipuram, ancient Kansi. Prakrit copperplate charters issued by the early kings from Kanchipuram often mention places just to the north in Andhra Pradesh, suggesting that the dynasty may have migrated to the Kanchipuram area. The Sanskrit and Tamil epigraphic records of the later kings of the dynasty indicate that the later Pallavas became dominant in the 6th century after a successful attack against the Calabras, which extended their territory as far south as the Kaveri River. The Pallavas reached their zenith during the reign of Mahendravraman I, c. 600-630, a contemporary of Harsha and Pulakshin II. Among the sources of the period, Xuanzang's account serves as a link, as he traveled through the domains of all three kings. The struggle for Venji between the Pallavas and the Kalukyas became the immediate pretext for a long, drawn-out war, which began with the defeat of the Pallavas. Apart from his campaigns, Mahendravraman was a writer and artist of some distinction. The play associated with him, Madhavila Saprahasana, treats in a farcical manner the idiosyncrasies of Buddhist and Shaiva ascetics. Mahendravraman's successor, Narasimhavarman I, reigned c. 630-668, also called Mahamal or Mamala, avenged the Pallava defeat by capturing Batapi. He sent two naval expeditions from Mahablipuram to Sri Lanka to assist the King Manavama in regaining his throne. Pallava naval interests laid the foundation for extensive reliance on the navy by the succeeding dynasty, the Kolas. Toward the end of the 8th century, the Gangas and the Pandyas joined coalitions against the Pallavas. As the Kalukyas declined under pressure from the Rashtrakutas, the Pandyas gradually took on the Pallavas and, by the mid-9th century, advanced as far as Kumbakonam. This defeat was avenged, but, by the end of the 9th century, Pallava power had ceased to be significant. As we witness the struggle for supremacy, trade, and the impact on the Indian subcontinent unfolds. And there you have it, a glimpse into the vast and intricate history of India from 2334 to 2279 BCE for past 4000 years. But our journey doesn't end here. What era or specific topic would you like us to explore next? Drop your suggestions in the comments below, and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Until next time, this is, Wiki, signing off. Stay curious.